you are, yes, sir. The Committee on Homeland Security will come to order. Uh, the committee is meeting today to receive testimony on assessing FEMA's readiness for future disasters. Uh, good morning. Before we begin, I want to observe that today marks the third anniversary of the tragic shooting at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida. Our thoughts remain with the victims and their families on this solemn day. I'd like to welcome our witnesses, Acting Federal Emergency Management Agency uh, Administrator Pete Gaynor and Mr. Christopher Curry of the Government Accountability Office. The committee is meeting today to assess FEMA's readiness for future disasters. The federal response to Hurricane Maria nearly two years ago was an abject failure. Slow response for the federal government FEMA staffing challenges and botched contracts left millions of our fellow Americans in Puerto Rico to respond to the devastating storm without the help they desperately needed from FEMA and other federal agencies. We may hear some revisionist history about the response today, but the fact remains that FEMA and its federal partners were not ready to respond to consecutive major storms in 2017. Unfortunately, Puerto Rico continues to pay the price. People there are also still suffering from desperate treatment by the president who continues to tweet his disdain for Puerto Ricans working to help their communities recover. Politicizing disasters or treating communities differently based on their political persuasion should be beneath any president. All Americans deserve the unwavering support of their president and the federal government in times of crisis, regardless of their political persuasion, economic status, skin color, or where they live. We need to restore the American people's confidence that they will have that support. Those of us who went to Puerto Rico, both in the immediate aftermath of the storm and more recently, as Puerto Rico continues to recover, no firsthand more remains to be done. As chairman of this committee, I'm committed to continuing oversight of recovery there. Meanwhile, as recovery from 2017 hurricane continues, the 2019 hurricane season got underway June 1st. Many of us are concerned whether FEMA has learned the lessons of 2017 season and will apply those lessons in response to future disasters. Is FEMA more ready to respond today than it was nearly two years ago? What more remains to be done? How can we ensure FEMA addresses persistent challenges and future risk? I hope to engage with our witnesses to help answer those questions today. Fortunately, the Government Accountability Office is working on a series of audits related to these questions at my request and that of several congressional colleagues. Their work so far has found it is imperative FEMA improve its disaster resilience, response, recovery, and workforce management efforts. FEMA's own after action report on the 2017 hurricane season acknowledges many of those concerns. I'm particularly interested in how FEMA will address its persistent disaster workforce shortages without having the right people in place, trained and ready to respond, FEMA cannot carry out its mission. This is particularly concerning to me because in my own state, we've experienced severe storms, flooding, and tornadoes already this season. I want to express my sincere appreciation to the employees of FEMA who work hard on behalf of our disaster survivors. Also, I remain concerned about a recently discovered FEMA data breach that exposed the personal addresses and banking information of more than two million U.S. disaster survivors. I hope the acting administrator can share with us the plan for helping those whose privacy has been compromised and preventing other similar incidents. Finally, I want to express my strong opposition to the president's proposal to slash 
Homeland Security and First Responder grants by more than $600 million for fiscal year 2020. These draconian cuts would undermine our nation's security and preparedness. Congress must reject the President's proposal and ensure state and local partners and our first responders receive the funding necessary to secure our communities. Before closing, I want to note that the President's nominee for FEMA Administrator will have a confirmation hearing before the Senate later today. I look forward to the Department filling one of its many vacancies and to engaging a confirmed administrator on the issues facing the agency. Again, I thank the members and witnesses for joining us and look forward to a productive discussion about FEMA's readiness to respond to future disasters. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Guest, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With the 2019 hurricane season officially underway, the resilience of FEMA and the American people will once again be tested. FEMA's mission is to help people before, during, and after a natural disaster. Over the last two years, FEMA has led the response of an unprecedented set of disasters. Hurricanes leveled large swaths of the country. Catastrophic wildfires destroyed over one million acres. Large floods inundated millions of homes, farms, and businesses, and tornadoes ripped the path of destruction through dozens of communities. So far this year, 28 major disaster delegate declarations have been declared. As a Mississippian, uh, I share the state with the chairman that is prone to natural disasters, and I'm familiar with the devastations of hurricanes, floodings, and tornadoes. Uh, in fact, as recently as this week, Mississippi's Governor Phil Grant requested a major disaster declaration for the state of Mississippi for severe storms, floodings, and tornadoes that hit our state. This request marks the third major disaster declaration inquiry from Governor Bryant this year. In each of these disasters, first responders and community officials worked hand-in-hand -hand with FEMA on response and recovery efforts. It is the strength of this federal-state partnership that is key to successful disaster preparation, response, and recovery. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses on the resilience of that partnership in the wake of such large-scale disasters that we've recently witnessed. I'm also interested in hearing about the progress FEMA is making in implementing the Disaster Recovery Reform Act. It is my understanding that last year, the Republican majority enacted D. RRA as the first major reform to the Stanford Act in over a decade. In addition to helping to expedite assistance to survivors and increasing state flexibilities, DRRA established a new pre-disaster mitigation fund to help communities preempt the damage that results from disasters. Mitigation continues to be our best defense against natural disasters. For every dollar we spend on mitigation, we save between four and eight dollars on recovery. The more we can help our communities mitigate disasters, the less they will rely on federal assistance when disasters strike. Finally, this committee has exclusive jurisdiction over preparedness and response to acts of terrorism. I'm interested in hearing from our witnesses their perspective on how prepared the federal-state partnership is to respond to a terrorist attack on American soil. As the threats to our nation continually evolve, it is critical that Congress continue to make robust investments in FEMA's preparedness grants. States and communities rely on these grants to build, sustain, and enhance their capabilities to protect the public from acts of terrorism. I thank the witnesses for appearing today, and I look forward to hearing their testimony. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, other members of the committee are reminded that under the committee rules, opening statements may be submitted for the record. I welcome our panel of witnesses. First, I'd like to welcome Peter Gaynor, the acting administrator at FEMA. Mr. Gaynor was confirmed by the Senate in October 2018 as FEMA's Deputy Administrator and has been serving as the Acting Administrator since March of this year. Prior to FEMA, Mr. Gaynor served as Director of Rhode Island's Emergency Management Agency and has a long history in public service and emergency management. 
Next, I'd like to welcome Mr. Chris Curry, Director of the Government Accountability Office of Homeland Security and Justice Team. Mr. Curry leads GAO's work on national preparedness and emergency management and has been at GAO since 2002. Uh, without objection, the witness's full statement will be inserted in the record. I now ask each witness to summarize uh, his statement for five minutes, beginning with Mr. Gaynor. Good morning, Chairman Thompson, uh, Representative Guest, and members of the committee. My name is Pete Gaynor. I'm the Acting Administrator for FEMA. Uh, on behalf of the Department of Homeland Security, Acting uh, Secretary McAleenan, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to provide this committee with an update on the agency's readiness for future disasters. First, thank you for the support over the past few years. Uh, Congress passed and the President signed into law the Disaster Recovery Reform Act on October 5, 2018. We are grateful for the passage of this important measure. It will assist the nation in reducing disaster risk and it will increase preparedness. I would also like to recognize the work of the committee and our partners at the Government Accountability Office for their oversight of this agency. Your efforts provide opportunities to advance our work and the emergency management profession. Having partners with the same goal of helping people before, during, and after disasters helps us continuously improve and adapt as a nation. Since 2017, FEMA has supported 179 major and emergency disaster declarations and 114 fire management assistance grants. As of June 1st, the first day of hurricane season, we have more than 5,700 employees deployed to support 52 active disaster declarations. I am proud of the agency's efforts and our staff who work tirelessly to carry out our mission. Even in this environment of unprecedented disaster workload, we have made substantial strides in achieving the agency's strategic goals and addressing areas for improvement identified in our own 2017 After Ash Report and our GAO partner recommendations. The scale and rapid succession of disasters in recent years has stressed re response and recovery capabilities at all levels of government. Following a disaster, FEMA serves as the lead coordinator for federal assistance, but the emergency management process breaks down when the agency is expected to assume a first responder role. Through our experiences, we have learned that success and emergency response is locally executed, state managed, and federally supported. FEMA's role is the coordinator supporting the recovery efforts of state and local elected officials while ensuring we execute the laws passed by Congress to dispense federal dollars in a responsible way. Our 2017 Hurricane After Action Report outlined key findings and made recommendations for improvement. The report also highlighted the importance of building a community-based response capacity. 80% of all declared disasters incurred obligations of 41 million dollars or less. Disasters below that amount have cost FEMA on average $100 million total per year in administrative costs. Aligned with the key focus areas in the After Ash Report, the agency's strategic plan builds on an existing best practices and identifies new initiatives geared towards achieving three overarching goals. First, to build a culture of preparedness. Second, to ready the nation for catastrophic disasters. And third, to reduce the complexity of FEMA. As part of our initiative to ready the nation for catastrophic disasters, FEMA is emphasizing stabilization of community lifelines. Lifelines provide indispensable services that enable continuous operation of critical functions that if not promptly restored, would risk health, safety, or economic security. In addition to the lifelines construct, FEMA has taken considerable steps to prepare, to prepare for the 2019 hurricane season. First, enhancing our logistics management. FEMA has significantly increased our commodity stock at strategic locations across the continental U.S. and island states and territories. In Puerto Rico alone, we have more than six times the stocks on hand on the island that we did before Irma and Maria made landfall. Since 2017, FEMA has increased incident management workforce strength by more than 20 percent, even despite, despite normal attrition rates, and hired more than 1,500 local hires to support their communities. We've also increased the number of staff rostered to the DHS Surge Capacity Force to augment FEMA assets when needed. We have made strides specifically aimed at survivor assistance. We have increased investments in urban search and rescue capabilities and increased our call center capability to better serve disaster survivors. We continue to embrace lessons learned and best practices in our planning and exercises. For example, we revised a national response framework to improve public-private sector coordination. Additionally, last week we conducted Shaken Fury, an exercise based on a catastrophic earthquake in the central U.S. Today, nearly two weeks into the uh, 2019 Atlantic hurricane season, 
uh, the disasters to our nation had never been higher. Given the historic magnitude of disaster over the past two years, if a hurricane makes landfall this year, it will likely hit an area that is still working to recover from a prior disaster. That means this year, even smaller and less severe storms could have a larger impact. By utilizing best practices, adopting response concepts, and increasing uh, pre-disaster investments to reduce risk, we can achieve the goals of building a culture of preparedness and ridding the nation for catastrophic disasters. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to any questions you may have. Uh, thank you for your testimony. I now recognize Mr. Curry to summarize his statement for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Thompson, uh, Mr. Ranking Member, other members of the committee. Uh, it's an honor to be here today to talk about GAO's past work on disaster preparedness, response, and also recovery. Uh, in the years since Hurricane Katrina, GAO's evaluated almost every aspect of FEMA's mission. And what we've found is that there's been major progress in a number of areas, but there continue to be major challenges in a number of other areas. And unfortunately, the challenges we face as a country and the risks we face aren't gonna make those challenges get any easier for the agency. Uh, the 2017 disasters were a historic year in terms of cost and damage and impact on our citizens, but I think it'd be a big mistake to look at that as a one-time event. Um, whether it's 500-year floods, uh, tornadoes like we've never seen before, and huge wildfires, these events are happening every year, and uh, it's important that we figure out how to address these things. I also think it's important to say that um, and not forget that it's important that we're preparing to respond and recover from acts of terrorism too, which are even more unpredictable than natural disasters too. On top of that, state and local expectations are also increasing for federal support as these disasters overwhelm their capacity. We've found since 2005, we have spent as a federal government approaching half a trillion dollars on disaster response and recovery in this country. And that's just not a sustainable path moving forward given our federal deficit and budget issues. Now, in terms of response, the first thing I'd like to talk about, uh, the 2017 disasters, the work we've done in that area shows a, a, a positive story, but also uh, a number of lessons learned and, and some not so good news as well. In Texas and Florida and California, what we saw was that years of preparedness and relationship building really helped to address some of the massive challenges we saw in Hurricane Harvey, Irma, and the California wildfires. It helped us to quickly evacuate people in California. It helped us to restore power to six million people quickly in Florida. It helped us to evacuate hundreds of flood survivors in South Texas too. And that's the good news, not that there weren't major challenges. In Hurricane Maria, um, although FEMA provided historic levels of support, um, what we saw is that everybody was overwhelmed in that case, both Puerto Rico and FEMA. Um, FEMA's already provided almost $15 billion in support for Puerto Rico, but it's gonna provide many billion dollars more. And so it's important also to focus on the recovery aspects. Regarding the workforce at FEMA, 2017 also highlighted and exposed many challenges that we've identified over the years and exacerbated those challenges. Lack of training, retention problems, really caused problems when FEMA was stretched thin. So I continue to be concerned about their ability to handle a really major catastrophic incident given what Mr. Gaynor said about uh, currently managing hundreds of active disasters. On recovery, uh, members of this committee that have had a disaster in their jurisdiction know that these recovery programs can be complex uh, and frankly very frustrating for state and local governments to deal with. We continue to see challenges in the recovery area. We just issued a report last week uh, that showed that FEMA could do a much better job of helping uh, elderly individuals and those with disabilities to, to, get, to get assistance. Uh, in Puerto Rico, we continue to see confusion and challenges with implementing public assistance grants. Uh, lack of guidance and procedures on how the program is being implemented is causing a lot of problems, which is delaying longer-term re recovery projects from being implemented, and, and not as quick as I think everybody, including FEMA, would want to see them implemented. Um, to their credit, I think FEMA has been very careful, particularly in Puerto Rico, with the concerns about uh, fraud, waste, and abuse, and has implemented additional controls to try to avoid those situations, too. And that's part of what's going on there as well. Lastly, I'd just like to talk about uh, where we go from here moving forward. Um, Mr. Guest, uh, Congressman Guest mentioned, uh, talked about resilience a lot. I think GAO and many others have, have proven and shown that investments in resilience work. They buy down risk over the long haul. Um, you know, what we've found over the years is that the federal government has invested only in resilience typically after a disaster strikes. And what that means is that 
Uh, it only, the, the monies for that only typically go to disaster locations too, which means that Mother Nature really dictates where we spend our disaster resilience funding. Um, we've tried to move that needle to, to be a little bit different and uh, recommended that FEMA develop a disaster mitigation investment strategy so we can know where best to in invest those dollars uh, when we get them. And also Congress has moved that needle forward too by, uh, with the DRRA, as was mentioned, and providing additional funding before disaster strikes so we can make smarter investment decisions as well. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, that concludes my statement. I look forward to uh, questions. I thank the witnesses for their testimony. I remind each member that he or she will have five minutes to question the panel. I now recognize myself uh, for questions. Uh, uh, Mr. Administrator, uh, do you have the staff necessary uh, at FEMA at this point to respond to uh, the disasters for this hurricane season? Uh, yes, sir. Um, we're ready every day of the year. Uh, we believe uh, we need not only be ready for hurricane season, but we're ready every day uh, for what we like to call Earthquake season, earthquakes can happen every day to include a whole host of uh, all hazards that uh, we're prepared for. So you are fully staffed at this point today? Uh, when it comes to the incident uh, no. workforce? No, no, no. Full-time female employee. Have you, are you fully staffed? For full-time employees? Yes. Yes, sir. What about the, the part-time? So the, the uh, incident workforce, we've uh, improved uh, Staffing of that 20% since, uh, since 2017. Uh, we continue to make improvements. Uh, it, it has been a struggle uh, for FEMA to make sure that we have enough uh, uh, disaster responders uh, in reserve or... So how short are you? Excuse me, sir? How short are you? Uh, we're we're probably short uh, a few thousand uh, employees when it comes to a reserve. How do you plan to close the gap? Uh, so we just concluded a uh, coordinated workforce review to look at uh, where we recruit uh, reservists in this case, uh, how we onboard them, how we train them. Uh, this past uh, spring, we trained 1,000 new reservists uh, to be ready for hurricane season. Uh, it, it is a it's a continuing improvement process. Uh, we, we know it's one of our uh, struggles, uh, but we have a plan to, to get there. One, one of the, one of the uh, issues has been how we qualify uh, these new employees, and we're trying to streamline that whole process so uh, it makes more sense for us. We can onboard quicker, uh, and employees uh, can get to the field faster. So you have 2,000 vacancies as of now in that area? It, it probably exceeds 2,000, yes, sir. Mr. Curry, uh, what's your analysis of that shortfall? I think two challenges here, sir. Um, one is how many total people do FEMA, does FEMA need to be ready for whatever can happen? And frankly, uh, I, I'm not sure that number is completely knowable, not knowing what's gonna happen, but what we've said over the years is that FEMA needs to do a gap analysis to figure out what that number is. And I'm not, I'm not certain to, that that's been done. We've found in the past it hasn't been done. The, the second issue though is for the people you have, who are those people? Are they trained? FEMA employs people with backgrounds and expertise in hundreds of different backgrounds from incident response to engineers. Um, and so the challenge we found in the past is that they lack certain numbers, particularly in some areas. And it's not just people responding in the weeks after, it's people long-term that need to be in those lo locations helping them recover too. So it's total numbers and it's then who's trained and what, and what skills. So give the, the committee uh, what skills you see FEMA lacking in that area? So a, a great example is in long-term recovery projects and programs. Frankly, this is the part of disasters that often gets forgotten long after the media has left the response, is the day-to-day -day back and forth on, on recovery projects, such as I mentioned in Puerto Rico on public assistance. Those are the engineers, the site inspectors, uh, the uh, people that are doing the calculations, the cost estimators, frankly, the the less glamorous jobs um, that are hardest to fill and FEMA has struggled to fill over the years. And those lead to delays and challenges in those recovery programs. Uh, speaking of Puerto Rico, uh, Mr. Gaynor, are you aware that there are a number of mayors in Puerto Rico uh, who have submitted uh, reimbursements uh, to FEMA that are substantially out outstanding? 
Yes, sir, uh, in, in general terms, we are. Uh, but I'd like to point out that uh, we, our program, uh, recovery program, public assistance program, is a reimbursement program. Uh, we work closely with uh, Core 3, who is our recovery partner in Puerto Rico. Uh, we share the same office space. Uh, they are responsible for making sure that uh, whether it's a local official or vendors uh, get paid. Uh, once they submit the, the proper paperwork and it's validated, uh, we send the money off. But I think the disconnect is between uh, the, the Core 3, who manages all the work. We don't directly pay contractors. We don't directly pay so, uh, locals. So, it so really you, is the Core 3 that owns that responsibility. Are you aware that a number of municipalities in Puerto Rico uh, have not been reimbursed for monies they've already spent? I, I think in general terms, there's always a lag between uh, work done, uh, the proper processing of the paperwork to make sure we don't pay for something that we that we I understand. But didn't do you buy. All, uh, do you also understand that they don't have any more money to spend to do any work in their municipalities until they get reimbursed? Yes, sir, we, we do understand that uh, liquidity is a problem in, uh, in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, and I think that's why we want to be extra careful. Uh, you know, Puerto Rico is $70 billion in debt. Uh, we want to make sure that, uh, and what typically happens after a long disaster, a long recovery, is uh, years after when you try to rectify the records and make sure all the payments are correct, uh, you have to do clawback. And what we, what we don't want to do, uh, because we're committed to building uh, Puerto Rico back better, what we don't want to do is claw back money because we uh, I, had, I, had I, loose... I, I understand it, but, but, but I've been a mayor involved in a, in a disaster of a small town. And if I expend all my funds helping my citizens waiting on reimbursement, the comment you gave me doesn't give me uh, any solace if I were one of those mayors in Puerto Rico waiting on reimbursement. Yes, sir. What I'd like for you to do for the committee is to have your staff prepare the reimbursements requests that have come in from Puerto Rico and give us the age of those reimbursement requests. We'd be happy to work for your staff, sir. And, and, and so, so are you aware that cities have to have two inspections before they get reimbursed once? Uh, so there's a, there's a process, and we, have, we actually establish a new process as validate as you go to make sure, uh, again, that the paperwork is proper and that those payments are legitimate. Uh, I, and, and we work through that. I, so, I understand, sir? and I appreciate it, but the same people come back and look at it the second time. The same people. Yeah. So the mayors are saying, why can't you just come once and say it's okay, it's not? So there may be different levels of validation depending on who validates and, and, and well, whether it's FEMA or so, CORE 3. So well, that's We'll be challenge. happy to get with your staff on uh, a list of uh, delinquent or uh, okay. unpaid well, validation. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get through some other questions. I yield to the uh, ranking member for some questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, I want to first thank both of you uh, for being here today, and I want to thank your uh, agencies for the uh, help that you provide our communities as they seek to recover uh, and prepare uh, for disasters. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Mississippi, uh, the state that both I and Chairman Thompson call home, uh, we appreciate the support of your agencies over the years as we have sought to recover from natural disasters, uh, particularly Katrina uh, that was so devastating to the Mississippi Gulf Coast. Uh, Acting Administrator uh, Gaynor, I want to ask you a question. Uh, in 2017, uh, we had Hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria. Uh, they presented FEMA with a challenge that uh, has not been seen before and hopefully will never be seen again as it related to timing, to scale, uh, and to the location of these three disasters. Uh, with respect to Hurricane Maria, uh, could you please uh, indicate to us uh, how the response and the recovery process has been more challenging to meet this disaster than others. Uh, yes, sir. So I think everyone stipulates that uh, this is a disaster like we've never seen, and combined with other, other disasters, uh, you know, 2017 was a challenge for everyone. Uh, specifically for Puerto Rico, uh, Irma, a Cat 3 on uh, September 10th, and then Maria, 10 days later, a Cat 5, uh, really, uh, again, stretched uh, the, the limits of uh, what, we, uh, what, we, what the challenges were. If I could share just some of the things that we did to support uh, Puerto Rico, because I'm not sure that uh, many have, have really realized how much effort 
uh, not just FEMA put into to recovery and response, but really all of government. Uh, it was really uh, the, one of the largest responses from DOD. 67,000 DOD personnel and guard personnel responded to Maria. Uh, it was the largest air, domestic air mission uh, of food and water in U.S. history, approximately 62 days of moving uh, food and water uh, to Puerto Rico. It was the largest air, uh, disaster air mission in U.S. history, 4,600 sorties uh, from DOD and our private sector partners uh, that flew more than uh, 3,200 missions transporting uh, urban search and rescue teams, uh, disaster medical teams, release supplies uh, and equipment, and evacuated residents uh, and patients. Uh, it was the largest disaster commodity mission in U.S. history. A uh, defense logistic agency delivered almost 4 million gallons of fuel and 106 million meals uh, and gallons of potable water and other life-sustaining uh, supplies to Puerto Rico. Uh, it was the largest generator mission in history. We delivered over 2,000 generators to the island. Uh, it was the largest disaster medical mission in history. Uh, 38,000 patients cared for uh, to include deploying thousands of DOD uh, medical providers, both on land and sea, treated on the USNS Comfort uh, that rendered critical medical care uh, to some of those patients. Uh, the largest request for assistance ever in any disaster uh, that we've seen. And the Navy's deployment of 11 ships that represented the largest naval flotilla to respond to civilian support operations in U.S. history. Corps of Engineers uh, ex executed the largest temporary power mission in history. And, and when it comes to how we deal disasters in the United States, we have this thing called the Emergency uh, Management Assistance Compact. Uh, 92 EMAC requests from 27 states assisted Puerto Rico in response and recovery from Maria. And today, we have 2,500 FEMA employees on the island. Uh, we were committed to a, uh, a response like we've never seen in U.S. history, and today we are still committed to the recovery in Puerto Rico. And can you just expand a little bit on the ongoing work that is occurring in Puerto Rico as we speak today? Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, as of today, we've expended about $15 billion. Uh, about $5 billion of that is in public assistance, uh, another $1.8 billion in individual assistance. Uh, we've repaired 112 homes, uh, roof, roofs. Uh, and the work goes on and on and on. Uh, again, we are committed uh, to the recovery of Puerto Rico to build it back better. We are complete partners with the uh, government of Puerto Rico. Uh, they're 50 feet from uh, my leadership staff in Puerto Rico. Uh, there's not a day that goes by that we're not down there uh, solving problems together. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Gaynor, um, the president said that we've spent $91 billion in Puerto Rico, and the numbers you quoted didn't add up to $91 billion. Yes, sir. Uh, um, I'll, I'll let the President's uh, comments stand on its own. So what I do know is, is you know, that may... Uh, uh, I, I will uh, let the, the, the President's comments stand on their own, but what I, what I can tell you is what we're doing today. Uh, again, 59, I mean, uh, uh, $15 no, billion I, I, dollars spent. No, 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 just have we spent $91 billion? I'm just trying to, no, sir, that's what uh, the president said. I think the, over the life of the disaster, that's what we estimate uh, the cost could be for uh, Hurricane Maria. No, uh, put on the screen. I just, uh, that's what the president said. $91 billion. Is that true or false? Uh, yeah, I, again, I think it's an estimate about what could be spent in Puerto Rico. Uh, right now, we have expended uh, $15 billion in, uh, from FEMA now, and another $27 billion from all other federal agencies. So, so does it add up to $91 billion dollars so far? Mr. Gaynor, does it add up to $91 billion? I think when recovery complete, it could, it could achieve that uh, number, yes, sir. But as of now, is it $91 billion? Uh, as of now, it's $42 billion. Thank you. Uh, yield to the gentleman from New York, Mr. Rose. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Gaynor, thank you for being here and for uh, your service. Recently, um, FEMA has announced on its website that it will be in late 2020 initiating risk rating 2.0 for flood insurance. Um, my understanding of this is that it will be a far more quantitative, hyper-targeted form formula, which will basically focus in potentially on individual homes 
rather than the entire country, entire regions, and so forth. Is this correct? Uh, in, in part, yes, sir. Uh, I, I think uh, with, uh, you know, NFIP needs to be overhauled. I think we all agree to that. And uh, our goal with uh, 2.0 is to make sure that customers better understand their flood risk uh, based on where they live uh, and to make sure that the rates that they pay reflect the risk that... Uh, Sure. Uh, now, th this, you, you can understand how this, especially when all you have said to this matter is 221 words on your website, that this is starting to scare people. Uh, would people be correct in their fear that they could start to pay upwards or see upwards of 18% increases in their flood insurance bills annually as a consequence of them fully understanding their risk? So the, so the cap is 18%, so yep. it can't be past 18%. Sure, but we could see, theoretically, people start to pay that 18% increase who were not formally. Uh, yes, sir. So again, it's, it's, uh, what we're doing is try to, to uh, reevaluate and rebuild the program to better reflect risk. Uh, mm -hmm. and so in some cases, um, uh, you know, those premiums do not reflect that. And so we're doing modeling right now, so some premiums could go up and some premiums could go down. Uh, I don't sure. know exactly what that looks like, uh, but we, I, I think you know, part of our d duty as emergency managers is to make sure that if people live, you, know, uh, you, you have to understand how to prepare yourself, and if you don't understand risk, I'm not sure how you can do that. So well, no, I, mean, I'm not talk, I don't think I'm not, uh, we're, we're not talking about an understanding of risk, we're talking about potential for a real affordability crisis. If you uh, jack up someone's premium increases to 18% per year, roughly, that's doubling in five years. Can you see how this could cause a massive affordability crisis for entire communities if this goes through? Uh, yes, sir, and, and, uh, and I think uh, we have an affordability issue today with, with NFIP. So uh, we have been working uh, with some of the staffers on the Hill on this. We, I think we'd be working, uh, willing to work with uh, any member here uh, about how we can uh, minimize the impact, uh, such a steep impact on maybe some of these uh, premiums that will go up. So uh, again, a work in progress. I don't think we have all the answers just yet, uh, but we believe that we need to uh, overhaul the program to better reflect risk uh, so people understand uh, uh, you know, uh, what is at risk when it comes to property. Right, I, I guess the lobby. point that I'm making, and, and I, do, uh, I would like to formally accept your offer to, to work with you and your team on this because this is amongst the most important issues to my community. I, I represent an island uh, in New York City I, and then a coastline in, in Brooklyn that and under, you, you say understanding of risk, they see affordability crisis. Um, and and it, this will be a problem unless we address yes, it. And, and I think uh, we want to achieve the same goal. We want to have a balance in both of those things. Uh, okay. We don't want it to be completely unaffordable because I think that uh, goes against what we're trying to do is, in, is to uh, close the insurance gap in the United States. Sure. Uh, so there's a balance there. And again, I think uh, our staff is, is absolutely willing to work with Congress right. to make sure that uh, we have a program that uh, meets everyone's needs. Okay, now with, with my limited time, uh, Remain, I wanted to talk just about counterterrorism. Um, the president ha has proposed, or his administration in their budget request, a cut to overall counterterrorism related grants by $600 million. I wanted to just give you a moment to offer from your perspective the justification for that cut. Uh, yes, sir. Um, and just as context, uh, I spent seven years as a local emergency manager in a city working for a couple mayors. Uh, I was a state director in Rhode Island working for a governor, so I understand how these things can, can, uh, can hurt. Uh, first sure. of all, I think the administration's budget reflects our priorities. Um, and we are struggling with uh, lots of demand and finite resources. And so th there's a hard choices that have to be made in any budget. And when it comes to grants, you look back at how much we have invested, I think Chris has kind of alluded to that, how much money we've invested in, in grants uh, over the years. Uh, I think $50 billion since 2005 uh, to build local and state uh, capability. Uh, this is a shared responsibility uh, between local, state, and the federal, sy uh, federal system. And, and I've, you know, again, success in this business yeah. is gonna take uh, uh, the ability to locals to execute, uh, the states to manage it and the, and the feds to support uh, Of course, and the NYPD understands that. I'm sure you, you, you know that. But I, I do just, in, in the, the last few seconds, want to make sure we're on the same page. So as a consequence of previous investments in counterterror screening, this administration is now saying that it, its greater priority are things like the border wall, not counterterrorism. Uh, 
I, I'm great, not, a greater pri I understand it's still a priority, the, but a greater priority. There are many different priorities uh, I think we're trying to do. I think one of the things we haven't kept up with is emerging threat. Uh, some of the grants that uh, were conceived after 9-11 have really not changed in the way we look at threat. Uh, so uh, we want to make sure that uh, new grants or uh, revisions to grant uh, reflect the, the current environment. Uh, so a whole host of uh, things that we're worried about. We are an all-hazards agency. We worry sure. about everything. The gentleman's time has expired. Chair, recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Katko. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you both for being here today. And Mr. Curry, the report's very thorough, and I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Gaynor, first off with you, I want to take a step back into kind of a case analysis, if you will. Um, on a little different aspect of FEMA, and that is the process by which you go about getting FEMA dollars. Uh, the Lake Ontario shoreline where I, my district lies has three counties in my district that have uh, experienced severe flooding two out of the last three years. They haven't gotten a FEMA designation, but I think this time it's most likely they're going to. So for the benefit of the record, for the benefit of my constituents back home, could you walk me through briefly how you go about getting the FEMA dollars to the people on the front lines? And then I might follow up with a with a, uh, um, another question. Yes, sir, are you talking about recovery dollars? Uh, uh, yes, sir, the flooding, is, the flooding is at catastrophic levels right now. So explain the process, how they go about getting that, those FEMA funding for a disaster relief. Uh, yes, sir, so typically it starts with uh, an assessment uh, by the governor or local official that declares a disaster. Uh, there are certain criteria that has to be met when it comes to public assistance and indiv individual assistance. Uh, Again, I worked for a governor for four years, so there's, there's a lot of process that has to be done to make sure you meet the criteria. Uh, the, the governor submits that request. Uh, if it meets all the criteria to uh, the regional administrator, uh, wherever region that you're in in the United States, and then eventually to us, and then uh, we forward it on to the president for approval. Uh, if approved, uh, you're eligible for public assistance and individual assistance, depending on what you ask for. Uh, typically, you get hazard mitigation dollars for the entire state, typically, to do pre-disaster mitigation. Uh, so there is a process. It can, it can be very quick. Uh, not all disasters are equal, so it depends what the particulars are of that particular uh, uh, city, town, or municipality. Uh, and if there's a question about uh, inability to get to uh, a disaster deck, uh, we'd be happy to engage uh, with your staff on, on how to help you get there. Actually, I know you have a very busy schedule. I would invite you to come up there to see it because it's a different type of disaster that we really, I think, would help you in understanding the, the, the delaying getting dollars for these types of disasters are uh, uh, compound the, the, the catastrophe. And uh, um, what I understand now is the water levels are already at all-time highs. Homes are ruined, shorelines ruined. One of my counties relies on almost 50% of their tax revenue from the shoreline properties, and it's going to have a devastating long-term effect. The longer it takes to get those dollars, the harder it is for them to recover and fully recover. Um, one of the concerns I've been told is happening is they have to wait till the water starts receding before they can start the process. And it's a rather lengthy process before the governor can issue the declaration, which then triggers asking the president to do it. So could you just speak to that process for a minute, that part of the process? Yes, sir. And typically, you know, and flooding is a, is a good example that, uh, you know, it's hard to estimate damage uh, while the floodwaters are up or the, the disasters still may be going on. Uh, and so what we do uh, as a joint effort between locals and state and the federal uh, government, we do these uh, preliminary uh, damage assessments to go out there and get eyes on all the damage, uh, calculate what that looks like in dollars, and again, submit that for the governor uh, for uh, uh, approval and submission to the president. Uh, again, uh, sometimes it's hard to estimate damage if there's, if there's still water or still ongoing uh, threat to that community. Uh, Again, we'll be there uh, in the community uh, as long as it takes to make sure we understand what the damage is and to help uh, local and state emergency managers and uh, local officials uh, get to their desired outcome. Thank you. And uh, you mentioned a disaster mitigation strategy, Mr. Curry, needs to be addressed. And um, I don't want you to comment on it. I just want to make a statement to both Mr. Gaynor and Mr. Curry. The disaster mitigation strategy is exactly why we have uh, uh, exponentially more damage this year than uh, two years ago because there wasn't enough disaster mitigation strategy going on. So uh, going forward, I want to engage with you more on that. But I want to switch gears with you if I can, Mr. Curry. Um, your report's very thorough, and I appreciate it. I was a former federal pro organized crime prosecutor in Puerto Rico for several years, and locals called me fiscal is what the term was. Um, so I'm well familiar with what uh, the problems are in Puerto Rico. The infrastructure problems back in the mid-90s were quite profound. 
but I was also cognizant of the fact that even back then, when the federal dollars came, they weren't always properly applied, and they were always off followed up by an awful lot of indictments of local officials on fraud. So um, you mentioned the fraud, waste, and abuse in your report, and I'm not trying to cast aspersion on anyone in Puerto Rico, but when you did this report, did you find any evidence or indications of fraud, waste, and abuse so far in the money's being sent to Puerto Rico? Not yet. Um, and, and to FEMA's credit, um, they've had to balance this having to get money out quickly, they always do, have to balance getting out money quickly but making sure it's spent right. In Puerto Rico, they're clearly, they did not have the capacity to manage these federal funds like states like Texas or Florida and California do who have years of experience. And it's part of the problem, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and that had to be built and they've worked together to build that over time. Good, I'm, I'm very encouraged to hear that uh, it's, it's not there and I hope it stays that way and I encourage both of you to, to keep a close eye on that and work closely with them and I, th I think they need the assistance. I think the capacity issue is, is a big issue there and uh, I thank you for your comments. Thank you very much. Chair, recognize General Lady from Illinois, Ms. Underwood, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Natural disasters and patterns of extreme weather events are happening more frequently and with greater intensity all over our country, including in my home state of Illinois. We know that human activity plays an indisputable role in climate change, which is linked to these extreme weather events. Ignoring that link is a direct threat to our national security. And so knowing this, I'm extremely concerned that FEMA has chosen to strip all mention of climate change from its 2018 to 2022 strategic plan. Mr. Gaynor, the Department of Defense has reiterated the homeland security threats of climate change in reports published every year since 2007. So, Mr. Gaynor, why, to the best of your knowledge, did FEMA remove all mention of climate change from this document? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, so, I wasn't here for the construction of the, of the plan in 2017, uh, but what, what I can tell you uh, about the plan, it doesn't mention anything about any hazards. It really is agnostic to any hazards. And, and I go back to my original statement that we are an all-hazards agency, uh, and we are committed uh, to preparing for and responding to any threats and hazards, uh, regardless of the cause, and that's how we that's how we approach it. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, why it's not in there? I, I think again, uh, no hazard is mentioned in there uh, to include any reference to uh, climate change. Okay, thanks. We know that previous iterations of the report have addressed climate change directly. And so if we're gonna have a proper level of preparedness in our country, um, I would hope that future iterations of the report would address specific hazards when we know that they have a disproportionate effect on our uh, national security. In Illinois, we're seeing extreme weather events like the recent bomb cyclo, uh, cyclone, as well as periods of heavy rainfall causing record level flooding and waterways across the Midwest. These events are threatening infrastructure, private property, and the lives of people in our communities. It's a timely issue. Every major monitoring station in Illinois along the Mississippi River reports current and forecasted water levels above the flood stage. The impact is being felt in my home district, the Illinois 14th, as the Fox River and the Des Plaines River have recently been swelling beyond flood stage and past record peaks. In preparation for this hearing, my office reached out to the Illinois Emergency Management Agency. Officials at that agency spoke highly of their good working relationship with FEMA and of FEMA's support overall. So Mr. Gaynor, I wanna take this opportunity to commend you and thank your staff at FEMA for their work. Mr. Gaynor, what resources do, does FEMA need from Congress to continue to support communities like mine that are impacted by increased flooding? Yes, ma'am, thank you. Uh, just a little bit about the, 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 the spring flooding that we've seen, really historic levels, yeah. uh, not only for Illinois, but for many states uh, from the Canadian border to the Mexican border, from Kansas to Kentucky to right. Florida. It, it's, it's been a pretty busy season for us. Uh, I think we have all the tools necessary, and I want to thank Congress for passing uh, the DRRA. I think one of the things we're most excited about uh, in that is pre-disaster mitigation. Uh, a 6% set aside uh, for all disasters, so we're going to set 6% uh, aside in the DRF, and we're building a program called uh, BRIC, uh, Building Resilient Infrastructure Communities. And we want to really uh, uh, create a new, uh, smarter program uh, than our current pre-disaster mitigation program. We have a program today, uh, but with the new level of funding, we want to make sure that uh, we really try to move the needle when it comes to pre-disaster uh, uh, mitigation across the nation. So that program uh, is being developed now. Uh, we're very excited about deploying that here in the next uh, 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 
I think by October 2020, uh, and we want to change the dynamic of how we prepare for disasters by investing in pre-disaster mitigation yeah. before the storm happens. We, we spend plenty of money post-disaster uh, and trying to fix things after the storm uh, hits. There's no, really, there's no way to, to, to do emergency management. Uh, I think this is really a transform, transformational uh, legislation that allows us to do that. So sure. I think DRA has really been helpful to, uh, to us and the nation. So what improvements has FEMA made to address past capability gaps in order to better assist these areas impacted by flooding? Right, so this new bill was authorized last year. I'm assuming that you made some internal improvements. Can you outline some of those? Uh, yes, ma'am. So between uh, the, the legacy program that we have now, pre-disaster mitigation, typically we, we uh, are authorized about $50 million a year. Uh, that's kind of average over the past 10 years uh, across the nation. Uh, $50 million across the nation doesn't really go that far. Mm -hmm. uh, you really can't do big, uh, uh, you know, high uh, projects that have a high return on investment. Uh, Congress provided some bridge money uh, between the PDM uh, legacy and BRIC, uh, about $250 million. That money is available today. Uh, right. So th that, that's how we're going to get from uh, the legacy to the new. And again, I thank Congress for giving us that extra funding to make sure we can make a bigger difference when it comes to pre-disaster mitigation in the nation. Thanks. So the extreme weather in the Midwest has prevented farmers from planting their crops, and these next couple of weeks could be their last chance to plant and all. Right now, Illinois farmers have only been able to plant 73% of corn and 49% of soybean acres compared to this time last year. I know that FEMA works with the Department of Agriculture, and so we're going to be following up with you to understand exactly how you all are working to ensure that our farmers are given the appropriate assistance that they need. Yes, Thank you, sir, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Chair recognizes the lady from Arizona for five minutes, Ms. Lesko. I think you heard me, but thank you for what you do. And I want to thank the men and women that work for FEMA and all the volunteers from all over the nation that come and help out at disasters. I have a question for you, Mr. Gaynor, and uh, you may have to follow up with me afterwards. But um, in April of this year, I led a bipartisan letter uh, dated April 5th, 19, with other members of the Arizona delegation to former Secretary Nielsen and yourself, I copied yourself, regarding FEMA's formula for awarding urban area security initiative, I think you call it UASI, UASI, UASI grants. Our three concerns outlined in this letter were that FEMA is not considering the complete or proper data from FBI, the threat levels of Phoenix UASI special events are not properly ranked, and that Phoenix's proximity to the border with Mexico is not considered when determining the risk profile of the Phoenix Mesa Scottsdale UASI region because you, you downgraded our th for that threat level. So how does FEMA work with the FBI to determine risk profiles for UASI regions? Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, so I think there's about 32 UASI communities, um, and multiple communities grouped as some of those that get the, uh, the grant. Um, so we have a, a risk formula that we use that, uh, that uh, considers the threat, uh, the vulnerability of that uh, community, and the consequences that could result from a, a number of different uh, threats. Uh, as a former state director, uh, it was part of my job to make sure that that uh, formula was fully uh, populated with all the factors that uh, go into that to include conversations with not only the FBI but other partners uh, in public safety. Um, you know, that, inf that formula in generally informs the, the Secretary of Homeland Security about how to make uh, awards on those grants. Uh, we actually had a conversation uh, with the, uh, the uh, uh, Secretary Nielsen, the former secretary, about uh, how to improve that formula to make it uh, more reflective. We had, we had a, a chat about borders. Uh, how to you know strengthen the border score? Uh, we have made some changes. Uh, you know, one of the things we want to focus on is emerging threat. Uh, we we added some language in past uh, UASC uh, awards to uh, recognize soft targets and uh, events that have mass uh, mass gathering. Uh, you know, the threat is evolving. We're always looking to make sure that we keep up with the threat. I'd be happy to engage with you and your staff about yeah. uh, you know how we can make that uh, that. Uh, you ask the award more, uh, uh, better informed for unique uh, jurisdictions like yours. Yeah, thank you, and I, I will take you up on that because um, we're, you know, going to get 
Phoenix area is going to get less grant money, uh, potentially because of the slower rating, and it, it doesn't really make sense to me. So here I um, looked over this uh, SEER rating of different big events all over the nation, right? And to give you an example, Phoenix has the Phoenix Open, this huge golf competition, right, that attracts 700,000 attendees over a five-day period. And it got a lower rating, a C rating, than the um, Kumquat Festival, which only had 35,000 attendees over a weekend. So to me, this makes absolutely no sense. And the fact that our Phoenix region is only 30 miles away from, the southern part of it is only 30 miles away from the Mexican uh, border, where we have this huge crisis going on right now, I, I really just don't understand it. And I'd like to work with you to try to um, perhaps make a bit more reflective of the actual threats. Yes, ma'am. We'd be happy to kind of go through the, uh, what we received from the state on some of those uh, submissions and uh, see what, uh, you know, how that was calculated. I'd be happy to, uh, to inf okay. uh, show you how it was done. And, and Mr. Gaynor, when you said you were the state director, do you mean the FEMA state director? Uh, I was a okay. state director in Rhode Island, so yes, ma'am. The state uh, emergency, director uh, Emergency management director, I'm sorry. Okay. The, I'm sorry, the, what were you? I was the emergency management state okay. director for the state of Rhode so Island. So perhaps I should be talking also to the Arizona state manager as well, because that's the person that helps guide this UIC uh, uh, rating. Is typically, that what you're it's saying? the state, uh, either the homeland security advisor for the state or the uh, emergency manager for the state. I mean, it could be a group of different public uh, safety professionals from the state. I don't think any state does it exactly the same, but. I would bet that uh, the public uh, or the emergency management director, uh, the homeless security advisor, uh, and those public safety partners are involved in uh, how they calculate or how, what they submit to calculate for that formula. All right. Thank you, Mr. Gaynor. I yelled back my time. Uh, Mr. Gaynor, I thought the UASI designations was made at headquarters. Sir? Based, on, based on what Ms. Lesko was talking at, about. At, at FEMA headquarters? Yes. Uh, no, sir, it's a DHS grant. We, we administer it for the secretary. Yeah, but I'm saying it's made in Washington, not in Atlanta. I mean, not in Arizona. Yes, sir, but uh, all, the so, state, all the state... Now, well, I just don't want you to give the impression that uh, those decisions that impacted Arizona uh, rest in Arizona when the decisions are made at headquarters at DHS. All I'm saying, sir, the process is typically uh, the headquarters puts out a solicitation for the grant uh, to all the states with the risk rating uh, for, for, for each particular uh, UASI. Uh, all, the, all the states or the UASIs review that, uh, and it comes back to headquarters for, for consideration. So it's risk-informed uh, based on uh, typically what's submitted from, uh, from states or UASI uh, communities. Well, Mr. Thompson, can I just briefly follow sure. up on that? So what I think you're saying is that, you know, it probably be to our benefit if it didn't happen, and I don't know, for our state uh, uh, emergency disaster person to promote um, maybe Phoenix more, that area, so that the, fe the I, feds know. Yes, ma'am. And, and, and again, as a state director uh, and a local director, mm -hmm. I was part of the uh, a UASI that no longer exists, so I'm, I'm pretty familiar with the, the process and what okay. uh, the UASI or the state or the local inputs to that, to, again, to make sure that uh, it's all highlighted for better decision-making at, uh, yeah. at headquarters. Yeah, yes, that makes sense. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chair recognizes the uh, young lady from New Jersey. Ms. Watson Coleman. Thank you, Chairman. And thank you to both of you for your testimony today. Just a couple of things. We just ended our appropriation season. And I am happy to report that even though the President's budget request for 2020 in several categories, from UASIs, to Homeland Security Grants, to Port Security Grants, to Transit Security Grants, to Emergency Management Performance Grants, to Assistance of Firefighters Grants, to Staffing for, for Adequate Fire and Emergency Response Grants, was even less than was enacted in 2018 and 2019. Uh, the Appropriations Committee has seen fit to increase those things, and hopefully you will have more resources to do the things that you need to do. 
I wanted to talk to you about two things. I want to ask about the federal assistance for low-income individuals as a disaster, after a disaster. There have been multiple reports, and I have one right here that I seek unanimous consent to put into the record. It's from the NPR report dated March 5, 2019. Without objection. Thank you very much. As I said, there are multiple reports lately regarding how low-income communities get the short end of the stick when it comes to federal recovery dollars. The current system is too complex for people putting their lives back together to navigate, having to apply to FEMA and the Small Business Administration and back to FEMA. Many simply get discouraged and drop out of the process because of the unnecessary complexity. And this is not even in dealing with the fact that there is a perception that there's a devaluing of the uh, loss that low-income and minority families are experiencing. What I'd like to know is what is FEMA doing to simplify this process for disaster victims? and survivors. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, first, I, I'd like to say that um, we don't discriminate uh, based on a di for disaster assistance on race, color, gender, political affiliation, religion. I don't uh, want to waste my time going there because the record will speak for itself. So if you just tell me what you're doing, what FEMA is doing to simplify the process for disaster survivors, I'd be grateful because I got one more question. Y y yes, ma'am. Uh, so. Uh, Recovery is a complex issue, not only for, uh, uh, it's a complex uh, system for everyone. Uh, and if I can give an example of what we're trying to do in Puerto Rico, uh, we're trying to do it a little bit differently, what we call 428 outcome-driven recovery. Uh, legacy systems uh, typically used um, uh, actual costs, and actual costs uh, make recovery uh, longer, more complicated, uh, what we're trying to do in Puerto Rico, as an example, 428, and we've done it around the country, but I think Puerto Rico is one of the, uh, one of the places where we, we see this uh, uh, benefiting everyone, is fixed costs. Uh, let's agree on what it costs. This is how business is done in America today. Um, and it incentivizes the local or state or commonwealth to, to actually uh, get okay. to the outcome faster. And uh, if it comes in under budget, they can use that money for uh, other needs uh, that aren't connected to the actual uh, project. If I it goes you're over- you're answering the question about how you establish the value, the costs associated with making someone whole again. I'm glad to hear that you're using actual costs yes, associated with so, that now, as opposed to the, the actual cost, the yeah. real cost. So, but what I want to know about is what are, you, what are you changing in your process or your requirement of these uh, survivors to get access to whatever it is they're entitled to, to make it less complex. Because one of the consistent complaints has been that the, con that the whole process has been so complex, cumbersome, and, and, and it discourages people from pursuing their rightful uh, needs. Yes, ma'am. So let me just correct one of, one of the things that you said. So uh, FEMA uh, does not make anyone whole. Uh, our, our programs, is when, okay. it, when it comes okay. to individual assistance. Whatever you do, can you tell me how you do it more simply for people who have found the process so complicated and so cumbersome that it has discouraged them and they've not gotten whatever it is that they're supposed to legitimately get? Uh, so I, I think in general terms, we, we work on this problem every day. So when it uh, comes to disaster assistance, uh, adding more call center takers, uh, that can take more calls and be more responsive. One of the things that we've uh, improved uh, over time. Uh, uh, okay, so I'm gonna ask you, if you would just give us, through the chairman, may I ask, for a list of improved actions that, in, that result with the interaction between FEMA and a person who is seeking assistance. Yes, ma'am. Okay, last question, real, whoop. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I want to talk to you about Puerto Rico, um, because my impression of Puerto Rico's issues is not just that Puerto Rico residents didn't know what to do. It didn't look like you all knew what to do. One of the things that um, you used that you said failed was sort of satellite phones. I wondered what you would do differently in the future. And I also would like to know, A, do you agree that there are a lot more projects that need to be done in Puerto Rico? If so, could you give us a list of those and the cost of those and the status of those? And last but not least, could you quickly just tell me, given what we all know about Puerto Rico, 
what was the criteria that the President of the United States used to say he didn't want to give Puerto Rico any more money? And with that, I yield back if you would answer my questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, ma'am. So, um, first about, uh, so we're talking about survival communications. Is that your question? Uh, about Puerto Rico's survival communications? Uh, 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 yes, ma'am. And, and this is a this is a problem in uh, all major disasters. Is communications is key uh, about how we respond and how we uh, uh, solic solic solicit information for uh, the situational awareness uh, for us to make better decisions. Uh, so uh, we have been focusing in Puerto Rico on uh, more survivable and sustainable and opera uh, operational uh, communications across uh, the Commonwealth. Uh, we made a major investment in making sure that uh, 78 uh, of the municipalities is connected via radio. So I think we've, we've done a pretty good job there. Uh, we'll continue to work on that. We send teams periodically to Puerto Rico to make sure that uh, we address those and we test them and we evaluate them. Uh, when it comes to projects, I'm not sure what projects uh, you're, uh, you're, uh, you're talking about. When, uh, public assistance projects? Particularly, I, I, I'm not sure I can answer in detail all the projects that are going on. Uh, now, not now, not at this moment, not this year. Uh, and, and maybe if you could help me restate the question, it would be. A, I want to know what what would it takes to restore Puerto Rico pre-disaster. That's individually and uh, infrastructure. I want to know what the status is of those outstanding projects the potential cost of them, and your plan of action as it relates to them. And then the last question was, knowing that there's still such a disastrous situation in Puerto Rico, could you just explain to me the criteria the president used to say he didn't want to give any more money to Puerto Rico? And I am sorry for taking so much time, Mr. Chairman. I yield back after I get an answer. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. So I, I think uh, we're doing hundreds of projects in Puerto Rico. I, I think I'd be happy to provide you uh, a snapshot of what we're doing. I, think we, I don't think we have enough time to, to go into all of them. And I'm not sure I have the, all the details on, on many of them. Uh, and again, this is an unprecedented uh, disaster. Uh, for your last question, um, could you just repeat that one more time? I am curious as to the criteria that the President of the United States used to determine what he said was that he was didn't want to give Puerto Rico any more assistance, that he didn't deserve it, or whatever it is he said that was negative, that indicated that he wasn't desirous of sending any more resources there. Yes, ma'am. And I, I know, you know, I know you didn't make the statement. I'm, but since you're FEMA, I'm asking you if you knew the criteria he used. So we're, uh, so whether it's Puerto Rico or the other 727 disasters that are open today, uh, those disasters are, were approved by the President of the United States and, and some administration. Uh, so we have the authority today, uh, based on what the President approved for Puerto Rico and many other disasters in 2017, 18, and 19, uh, to deliver that disaster assistance. Uh, that's how we're operating today, and that's how we'll continue to operate uh, under the authority that we have uh, under the Stafford Act. But you certainly have not been able to answer it, and thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Chair, recognized gentleman from Texas, Mr. Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, appreciate you being here. Mr. Gaynor, uh, Thank you for your service in the Marine Corps uh, in Iraq. Uh, I am going to go into something that is, that is close to home for me. I have a terrific district that where I have a lot of people who uh, train search and rescue dogs uh, to a FEMA standard. Uh, and these people, uh, it, is, it is their, their hobby. Uh, they, they take their weekends and after work and they go and train these dogs. And then when there is an, a disaster, they uh, take off work. They literally drive uh, hundreds of miles, if not thousands, uh, to go and help their fellow Texans or fellow Americans, wherever they may be, and uh, help recover uh, the bodies uh, of people who perished in the disaster or survivors, uh, actually find people alive. Um, and something I found when I talked to this, this community of, of great volunteers, 
uh, is that they found that when they would uh, go to Galveston uh, during a hurricane and work for you know days on end without sleeping, that they try to go into a hotel uh, to go uh, get some rest or go to a restaurant and get something to eat, uh, they were refused service because they had a dog with them. Uh, and something I was able to do in the Texas legislature, um, working with Republicans and Democrats uh, unanimously to uh, allow those dogs, those search and rescue dogs, to have the same legal status as service animals, as seeing eye dogs. Uh, that, and, and, and that just made sense uh, to help those volunteers. And I just was wondering if you could speak to us today about the role of these, um, these uh, search and rescue dogs that are trained to a FEMA standard and what role they play uh, in helping find survivors uh, and finding the remains of loved ones. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Um, so f f uh, one of our crown ju jewels uh, at FEMA is our urban search and rescue uh, assets. Uh, 28 federal teams across the nation, um, and there's many other urban search and rescue teams uh, that support local and state, uh, but it really is uh, our go-to force when something really bad happens, especially with uh, collapsed structures. Um, and we have a nation of great volunteers that make this all possible. So whether on the federal level or the local or the state level, uh, volunteers really make uh, the magic happen in a disaster. Uh, to include those that have, that have uh, dogs, uh, and some of these dogs uh, help uh, with the recovery of uh, victims, again, typically uh, structural co collapse. Uh, we cannot uh, do our job uh, as a emergency management agency or as an urban search and rescue team uh, without these uh, highly trained animals. Uh, we make big investments, uh, both in people when it comes to search and rescue and to our uh, animals. I think anything that can help uh, make it easier on our, our teams and our volunteers to uh, get their animals uh, to a disaster location, uh, I'm all for it. Okay, thank you. And, I just, and just one thing that has struck me as I talk to these volunteers is they say, you know, there just aren't enough uh, search and rescue animals that are on the payroll uh, that, that the federal government has or that the you know, city of Dallas has or that, you know, they're just, they're, we just don't have enough, you know, on the payroll. So you've got to have this volunteer force that then steps in and, and, and fills the gap uh, to help, help in this situation. Yes, sir. Uh, any help, I think that, uh, again, getting volunteer dogs or uh, dogs that are assigned to urban search and rescue teams uh, to a disaster, I think, would be helpful to all of us. Okay, well, I'm working on some legislation to try to help search and rescue dogs uh, get to disaster sites uh, to give them the same a FEMA standard dog uh, to go to a FEMA rescue site to be able to have the same legal status as a seeing eye dog. So tying into existing federal statute um, and have bipartisan support. So it's a very small small piece of this of this bigger puzzle, but I appreciate uh, your comments, Mr. Kainor, and thank you for your service. Thank Mr. you, Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much. Chair recognizes the lady from New York. Ms. Rice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Gaynor, I sent you a letter on May 9th of this year um, requesting some information regarding um, an issue that's going on now in my district regarding substantial damage assessments. Um, as you know, we are six years after Superstorm Sandy, and the town of Hempstead within my district continues to face challenges with their disaster recovery efforts. And there was a, uh, they're, they're now recently, um, the issue that they're dealing with is how to handle newly surfaced preliminary damage assessment records, detailing what homes were badly damaged after the storm and did not apply for any building permits. Um, and what that's gonna require is thousands of homes are going to need to receive what they call an SDA, substantial damage assessment. And some of them may need to be lifted as a result of that. So the, the purpose of my letter was to point out that it, it appears that there is a lack of universal standards for the SDA process and how um, there seems to be no universal metric standard for all floodplain managers who perform the SDAs. Um, and I've also been made aware that the extent to which a homeowner, homeowner may be able to appeal his or her SDA depends on the local jurisdiction. So um, my letter asked if you could explore possible solutions to ensuring greater consistency in the SDA process as well as the SDA appeals process. And I have yet to receive a response, and I, I don't know if you can respond right now or if you have the answers now. So, so I'm gonna have to submit for the record, ma'am, on, on some of that. I mean, I don't know the details of this particular uh, issue. Uh, I will check on your letter to make sure that uh, we, we have it and we're processing it. And I will have my 
uh, recovery experts uh, follow up with you and your staff to make sure that we address your concerns. If, if you could, because yes, literally we're six years post Superstorm Sandy and people are still having these issues arise. So um, this was dated May 9th. I can give you a copy of it now to make sure that you get it, but I would really appreciate a, a quicker response. I'll have one of my staff get the letter, ma'am, before we're done. Thank you very much. So now, um, af after Hurricane Irma, FEMA emptied out its distribution center in the Caribbean and did not have um, any many supplies in stock to respond to Hurricane Maria. We were in Puerto Rico with a trip with the chairman um, in uh, March, and we saw empty shelves um, and water bottles that were either expired or very nearing their expiration date. What are you doing to ensure that there are enough supplies in the area to respond to multiple catastrophic storms in one season? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, so we've, we've had a couple of island challenges, not only Puerto Rico and U.S. Virgin Islands, but also uh, Hawaii and, and Alaska. Not actually, actually an island, but same kind of problems when it comes to getting commodities uh, uh, far distance. Uh, so uh, when it comes to Puerto Rico, uh, we've made a major investment to make sure we have more commodities on island. Uh, so where we had one warehouse uh, pre-landfall, uh, Irma Maria, now we have six, uh, one on U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, we have six times the commodities uh, on hand to make sure we can deal with uh, uh, any new disaster or uh, threat to the Caribbean. Uh, Hawaii, we're gonna ex we have expanding uh, the warehouse in Hawaii. Uh, we're going to double the footprint there. Uh, we have a plan on the books to build a warehouse in Alaska. Um, and what we've learned is that uh, it's much cheaper, much more efficient uh, to have those uh, commodities as close as possible. In some cases, uh, you put it too close, you may lose your stockpile. Uh, transportation costs, uh, when it comes to, you know, whether it's from uh, continental U.S. to Puerto Rico or continental U.S. Uh, to Guam or Saipan, uh, is expensive, and so I, I, we've learned some valuable lessons to make sure uh, that we put some warehousing on some of these uh, remote islands and locations so we can respond faster. I mean, I think uh, we, we realize that it's just good business to do this. I would agree. Um, your written testimony states that FEMA will modernize housing inspections to improve the survivor experience and streamline the process. Um, I mean, I certainly welcome that promise because after Superstorm Sandy, communities in my district were overwhelmed um, with the necessary but very time-consuming task of building by building damage assessments. So can you give us any more information about what this modernization might look like and how you will engage states and localities in the effort to make improvements? It would help if people knew kind of who, who live in these areas that are vulnerable if they would know the process beforehand so that they're, they're not playing catch up post storm. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so th this has been a, a struggle for us. And I think uh, anecdotally, you could have as many as 14 inspectors come to your home after disaster, not only from FEMA, yeah. but from other agencies. Uh, we're working hard on trying to uh, uh, downsize that through technology, through uh, mapping. We made a big investment in LIDAR mapping uh, so we could do sampling. Uh, across uh, an uh, impacted area to, to, to make it faster. Uh, again, I'd be happy to share some of the, the more technical aspects of what we're trying to do uh, uh, after, the, after the hearing, uh, but, but we know it's uh, one of our uh, 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 issues that we have to resolve because, again, uh, I think our goal is to make it one-stop shopping. Uh, you should yeah. see one person from the federal government to help you resolve your needs. Uh, it's not there yet. Uh, we know it's a problem, and we're working towards uh, minimizing that interaction. Also coordinating with state and localities ahead of time would, would be helpful as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, is, it is, in damage assessment, it is, it is just not the federal government out there. Right. It is really a team effort, uh, a joint, uh, they call them joint uh, PDAs, preliminary damage assessments. So uh, local officials, state officials, and federal officials go out together uh, to look at that, that damage and make an assessment and put it in the books and then move it on so we can deliver disaster assistance uh, to those disaster survivors. Thank you, and I, I will follow up with you on that, and I look forward to an answer to my letter. Thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Chair, recognized gentleman from Texas, Mr. Crenshaw. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to our witnesses for being here. I, I want to start off um, down a line of questioning about what the federal government is best suited to do and what is, is best done at the state level and what kind of progress we're making since the DRA. Um, in, in Texas, we 
we do take on a lot of those re responsibilities. Um, this is for Administrator Gaynor and, and Mr. Curry. How, what kind of duplicative roles have you seen between the local, state, and federal levels, and what, what have you assessed can be devolved from the federal level down to the state and local and, uh, to make it more efficient, the entire process? Uh, I, I think um, one of our challenges uh, as a country is post-disaster housing. Um, first of all, I think no matter disaster or no matter location, it's a challenge. So whether it's California wildfires or Puerto Rico uh, or uh, Lee County, Alabama, uh, post-disaster housing is, is an issue. Uh, you know, we have a capability to deliver uh, temporary post-disaster housing uh, solutions like travel trailers and, and uh, 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 mobile housing units. Uh, we'll never have enough to do that. So uh, I, I, what we really want to do, and I think we did it in Texas with uh, Governor uh, Abbott about yeah. uh, the state taking on that housing solution uh, with our support. Uh, I, I think we really need, and I spoke to the, the, the governors at uh, uh, this fall's NGA in, in uh, D.C. about uh, governors having a deliberate post-disaster uh, housing plan okay. uh, that we would fund, but they would deliver to their constituents. Uh, I'm not sure that we're ever going to be able to figure out exactly what a governor or a, a mayor needs. I think our obligation is to fund it. I think the state's obligation is to have a plan uh, that is on the books that we uh, all agree on. So when it, when it happens, we're on, we can... We're on track to get there? Absolutely. Yes, sir. Okay. Mr. Curry, do you have anything to add? One, to one point I'd make, I think you were here when I, I said the federal government spent almost half a tr uh, trillion dollars on disaster relief since 2005, 50 billion on preparedness grants. So in our view, since 9-11, with all that investment funding, what we would expect over time is that we've addressed our capability gaps and built in enough resilience to where the, the local governments can handle more and more over right. time. But what we're seeing is the opposite. We're seeing additional expectation of federal assistance over time. Right, and that's a problem. It's not a problem we have in Texas. Uh, thank God. We have about $12 billion in the Economic Stabilization Fund and then another uh, billions uh, added it biannually from the Texas budget. The last le legislative session, my friend, Texas State Senator Brandon Crichton, who also represents part of my district, led the passage of SB7, which created a flood infrastructure fund and provided Texas dollars to match federal funds. We just passed $2.5 billion bond in our county uh, for flood mitigation. Um, and so how does that compare to the rest of the states? Because it, it, it is a problem. We can't keep going to the federal government every single time. We have to build some resiliency at home. Uh, so, so I'm going to uh, continue Chris's line of thought about uh, grants. Uh, a lot of these grants since 2005, uh, you know, the, w the way it works is that you do an assessment of your uh, threats and vulnerabilities, whether it's a local or a state. Uh, the federal government gives you those grants to buy down that, that gap. Uh, we want to make sure that you're actually buying down that gap. And in theory, uh, over time, you buy down the gap and you move on to the next risk that is high. Again, uh, apply those federal dollars to buy that down. Uh, hopefully, if you're a state or local, you've invested some of your local and state dollars in that, right. in that risk. And, and, try and, to and offload that's what I'm getting at. And that's what I'm getting at. You know, so, I think as a, as a country, we need to come to the understanding that a lot of this resiliency has to be built at the local level so that the federal government is coming in when it needs to come in, not just as the, the first option. Uh, I, I want to move on to, um, I actually want you to continue along the same lines that you were talking about before with, with Congresswoman Rice about the many different agencies involved in the process and, and how are we making progress to to, to, to make this more uniform. I mean, in Texas, we've been waiting on HUD money forever. Why can't we just use FEMA <laughs> for, for disaster relief? Why are there so many different agencies coming to knock on people's doors? Uh, yes, sir. So uh, I just want to tie it back to our, our, uh, our strategy. Our, our, our uh, goal three is to reduce the complexity of FEMA, and that could apply to help reduce the complexity of the federal government in some cases. Uh, so when it comes to... Um, uh, Let's, let's stay on uh, housing. Uh, you know, we try to, we try to partner with our uh, organizations that have federal disaster programs. There are 19 federal departments that have disaster programs, uh, about 95 different programs among, uh, I think it's 16 uh, federal departments. So we have a lot of work to do to make sure we, we blend that together. We're trying to do this in Puerto Rico with our outcome-driven recovery where we're just not using FEMA money to solve a problem. We're using all of federal government money to solve a problem together. Uh, in some cases, 
Uh, you only can use, again, based on statutes and, and, uh, and law, you only can use that money for certain things. Uh, but in our outcome-driven recovery, we're trying to come blend that all together to get a better result uh, for the American taxpayer and get a better result for uh, the residents of Puerto Rico. Uh, you know, HUD is, you know, HUD is a, a great partner of ours. Um, I think one of the problems that we hear uh, across the country is you know, HUD makes an announcement of a grant uh, pretty quickly after disaster, but it takes some time uh, for a local or a state to actually uh, submit a plan, get that plan back, and get that money on the street. It could take, in some cases, up to a year. Uh, we'll work, we work with HUD every day in trying to you know, make sure our programs are complementary uh, and that they blend together. Uh, we still have some work to work to do, um, but but it is a challenge. Yeah. Up to the chairman. <laughs> Thank you. Chair, recognize the lady from California, Ms. Barragon. Um, thank you. Mr. Gaynor, we've seen horrific wildfires in California in the past few years. The lucky ones lost everything and the unlucky ones lost even more than that. As first responders are working tirelessly to save lives on the ground, we have a president tweeting to withhold aid from survivors. It just makes me sick and I hope it makes you sick too. Can I have your commitment right now that FEMA will not abandon the disaster survivors in California who are still struggling to re rebuild their lives? Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, you know, we are, again, heavily invested in, in California. I actually talked to Governor Newsom last week uh, about uh, wildfire preparedness and recovery. Um, I, I think we have a good partnership. Uh, we'll have a, we'll have a, that partnership will continue. I think we're all after the same things when it comes to make sure we keep uh, people safe. Uh, before a disaster. I know the, 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 the state of California has invested heavily in uh, pre-disaster mitigation when it comes to wildfire. Uh, I think the, the governor is on the right track in, in doing that. Uh, they have, they have uh, sufficient uh, HMGP money, again, uh, hazard mitigation money to help uh, buy down that risk. Uh, again, no matter if it's California or it's Puerto Rico or it's another state, uh, we work in partnership to make sure that we get the outcome that everyone uh, deserves and right. wants. Thank you. Um, I also understand that FEMA play, plans to implement its national public assistance delivery model in Puerto Rico and will establish a consolidated resource center or, or CRC in Puerto Rico for processing permanent work requests. How does this differ from the process that has been used to date? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, it's a great question. So uh, the, the process that we use in Puerto Rico, the 428 alternative uh, process, is not changing. I mean, we, we've committed to that. Uh, the governor has committed to that uh, from the beginning. Uh, so the process doesn't change, but the, uh, the way we track uh, recovery is we're adding in this, what we're calling the new PA delivery model. Uh, it's been used in more than 100 different disasters across the nation, uh, relatively new. And uh, you know, our goal is to improve efficiency, accuracy, consistency, uh, when it comes to managing all, you can imagine the paperwork. On How is that different place. though than from what's being used now? Like what, what is being implemented? I, I think it was probably a manual. We've been, uh, you know, the new model wasn't exactly ready uh, when we started recovering in Puerto Rico. Uh, I think there was an appetite for both FEMA and the, the Commonwealth to, to get the, the model in, in use. And so uh, we put it in use in May uh, last month. Uh, and uh, we've added a new fourth uh, uh, consolidated resource center to make sure that uh, we have more con consistent uh, technical and administrative review on this process. So it's kind of technology based? It, yes, ma'am, it is. Okay. And I think one of the other things that we're trying to do is uh, validate as you go. Uh, okay. I mentioned this before about uh, trying to avoid clawback. Uh, we don't want to do that. And so sometimes it takes a little bit longer, but I think the end result will be better for everybody. Okay. Um, Mr. Gaynor, after Hurricane Maria, many disaster survivors were initially denied for FEMA aid because the agency did not understand the housing system on the island. Now, many were so discouraged by the process that they simply gave up. What has FEMA done in terms of training or otherwise to ensure that differences in local laws don't mistakenly stop individuals from receiving aid? Um, are, you, are we talking about the temporary sheltering assistance? It's uh, generally speaking, what I've been to Puerto Rico twice. We've heard constituent uh, people there is basically saying, hey, I, I applied for aid, this has taken a long time, um, or we've got denied and people are giving up. And so, for me, it's trying to find out, is FEMA doing anything in terms of its training to um, ensure that any differences, maybe they're under, not understanding of, of housing locally there. Yes, ma'am. Um, um, doesn't prevent people from doing I, this. I, so so uh, we made an investment in uh, case management in Puerto Rico. Uh, we invested about 80 
million dollars uh, to help and, and, and uh, across uh, all municipalities uh, to make sure that we address, and I think there's about 21,000 uh, case management uh, cases on file right now, uh, but we've uh, invested heavily on that to make sure that we uh, address any concerns a survivor may have, uh, you know, whether they didn't have all the documentation from, uh, in the beginning um, or there was some other uh, issue with uh, their application. Uh, we understand that uh, that uh, this can be a problem sometimes, especially after a major disaster, that you don't have, hand, you don't have your hands on your records. Uh, so we have case management professionals uh, across Puerto Rico right now uh, handling all these cases. If there's any in particular that you'd like to address, I'd be happy to uh, get with you and your staff after to, uh, to uh, Mr. Gaynor, that. I have only 10 seconds left. Do you believe in climate change? Uh, I believe that the emergency management agency is ready to deal with any disaster, uh, no matter the impact. That is our focus. Are you use, Are you considering climate change? Um, maybe at some other time you can explain how FEMA integrates the consideration of climate change and extreme weather into its policies and programs. We have had hearings here on the Hill. We've had the military come out and talk about how climate change is a and should be continued, consider, considered a national security crisis. And I want to make sure that FEMA is integrating um, the consideration of climate change um, in what it's doing, its policies and programs. Um, I'm out of time, but if you could um, maybe respond in writing or at a later time, that'd be great. Yes, ma'am. You'll back. Thank you. Chair, recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. McCall, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses. Uh, I was on the ground when Harvey struck. Uh, it was uh, horrific. Um, but I must say, I, I commend FEMA for the good work you did uh, pre-positioning assets, uh, getting an advanced emergency declaration, uh, and we saved a lot of lives. You know, probably uh, 20,000 lives in that effort, and it was uh, commendable, and, and it was a joint effort. Uh, my state um, operations center, uh, the, the National Guard, to the Coast Guard, to FEMA, um, <clears throat> I would uh, give it an A+. Plus. I think, um, a lot of the frustration in my state and others is, is and, and I, I, I will admit it's not really under your jurisdiction, has been the recovery. Now you have the short-term housing, but a year, a year ago, I remember working with my leadership to get a, a $60 billion package uh, passed by Congress. And we did it in fairly short order after this uh, disaster. Um, we just passed another declaration, disaster, as you know, um, and um, Senator Cornyn and myself put a provision to expedite uh, this money that's been held up at HUD uh, for a year. Four billion dollars to my state. Um, recognizing that's not completely within your lane of jurisdiction, but you know, how can we take a more whole of government approach? Uh, so they are a partner, I think, in this effort. You're short term, they're long term. Uh, what can we do differently to stop this kind of, this is what drives people crazy, is when Congress acts, and particularly members who got this done, and then a year later it's still being held up in the process. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I, I don't want to speak for my counterparts at HUD. Uh, what I can tell you is that uh, we have a, clo part, a close partnership uh, with HUD on, on many different uh, matters. Um, I, I can't disagree that it probably takes too long uh, and so whether you're from Texas or North Carolina or you're, or you're from uh, Puerto Rico, uh, you know, as an elected leader, you want to be able to deliver all the resources that the federal government can, uh, can muster uh, in the shortest amount of time. And I think that is our goal. Uh, you know, obviously we have work to do. Uh, like I stated before, uh, 16 other federal agencies with, you know, in excess of 90 different federal disaster programs uh, that you need to blend. Uh, it is a major undertaking. And it's a major undertaking uh, not only for a big state like Texas, but you can imagine it's a major undertake, undertaking for small states that don't have that uh, built-in bandwidth to manage, you know. Uh, I, I, I agree. You know, like, uh, Texas is, is ready. I think Puerto Rico is caught in a different situation. Sir, can, I, can I say something real quick about yeah, that? And I got limited time, but go ahead. Okay. On, on the HUD, the CDBG issue, we just issued a report this year, and we had a matter for Congress that uh, Congress needs to permanently authorize a program such as CDBG because the pro it's not permanently authorized. So every time it's appropriated funds in the supplementals, which it has been over 10 years, basically the program is created from scratch. There's a regulatory process. You know how long that takes. 
So you have to spend a year or two creating the program each time to begin figuring out how you're going to have to use the funds. I think that's an excellent recommendation. And I, I was going to go to you for maybe solutions that the chairman and ranking member can look at to, to make it more whole of government rather than siloed off with all these agencies. The, the last one I got a little time is the Army Corps. Uh, you know, 1940s, they identified um, Barker and Attucks. They built reservoirs. But they identified Cypress. Creek, and they were going to build a levee a wall or maybe a reservoir, and they never did that. And so what happened was it, it uh, basically had a watershed event where it went down from Cypress to Barker to Attucks, Buffalo Bayou, downtown Houston. Uh, you know, just a complete disaster that could have been prevented with proper flood mitigation projects. This thing is still being held up. It takes years to study uh, before they can even build um, and again, it's the same frustration my constituents have. What's going to happen this, as we go into hurricane season? Are we going to have this watershed of, event again? And so I would, uh, I know again, Army Corps is not, under, but the whole government approach, maybe the GAO can look at ways that we can fix this so it doesn't take so long. Yeah, well, we, ha we have actually, and that's a, the, that scenario is a perfect example of what's so difficult about mitigation and resilience dollars. It's, it's so difficult in, in the present day to, to, to give the funding you need to, present, to prevent future damage. It's just human nature. Um, but there are ways, like for ex FEMA now has the ability to coordinate its funding with Army Corps funding to build levees. It used to be that that funding only had to be provided to Army Corps. And so what happened was, is those, they were never, there were thousands of projects across the country, they were never fully funded. And so those, the scenario you mentioned, those are all over the country. There's levy projects that have never been funded. Well, this one's funded, and I look forward to following maybe up with the two of you and Army Corps about how we can move the process a little faster in addition to uh, HUD. And uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I thank Mr. Cleaver for allowing me to um, exchange places with him. Uh, I'd also like to thank the witnesses for appearing. Let me move rather quickly and ask, or maybe add, Mr. McCall, for edification purposes, we have a CDBGDR bill. Uh, Ms. Wagner uh, and I have sponsored it. It actually originated with her, and we're trying to get that done now. Be honored, honored to have your support, and we'll make sure that you get a copy of it, because what you said is eminently correct. We do reinvent the wheel each time we have institutional knowledge that has been lost, and sometimes it can be more difficult to reinvent than others. So thank you for the um, admon admonition. Uh, just a quick question about shelter in place. Uh, when we hear these words, shelter in place, there are a good many people who have homes that are not suitable as a place to shelter. The question that I have has to do with pre-qualifying community centers, schools, and churches for shelters such that people will, in a community, know where the nearest asset is. If we are doing it, great. I need more intelligence on how to get into the loop. If we are not doing it, I'd like to be a part of getting it done. Uh, I'll yield to you, Mr. Gaynor. Yes, sir. Uh, so I'm going to put my local emergency manager uh, hat on. I was a local emergency manager in the city of Providence for seven years. Uh, so uh, sheltering is truly a local responsibility uh, for the most part. Uh, uh, and I can tell you how we did it in our community is that we... we yeah, I just ask this, intercede and ask. I, I, I assume that that would be your answer. Let me just ask this question now. You have greater expertise than most local folk. And as a result of the expertise that you have and the resources that you have, would legislation uh, which allows you to work with locals to pre-qualify venues such that we don't have to, at the time of the incident, with all of the things that are happening, try to get a shelter and then get notice to people as to where the shelter is, would that be helpful? Uh there, there may be other things that are out there today, sir. So I'll just use what I use as a local emergency manager. I use the Red Cross has a survey uh, team that goes out and certifies shelters uh, for hurricanes. 
Uh, so I use that resource uh, as a local, and, and it's available across the country. Uh, they have a survey sheet. They go out. You, you do it together, and you certify that shelter. And if it meets the, the, the criteria on the, on the shelter, it becomes an official uh, asset of the Red Cross uh, at the national level and at the local level. Um, and so I, I think it's, it's out there. Uh, you can always get te technical assistance from state uh, uh, sheltering experts and the federal uh, government for, for sheltering. Uh, I, I just think it's probably we need to make better connections uh, between state and local and, and the feds on some of these issues. Uh, if, there's a, if there's a sheltering issue in your community, I'd be happy to uh, meet with you your staff to see if we can uh, you know, make those connections now before we actually need to use that shelter in a disaster. Here's why I'm, I'm um, interested in working with you on the project. I've had churches who have volunteered their facilities and had damages, but they wanted to be of help. But getting them the necessary repairs can sometimes be a great challenge. So my assumption is that if I have the entity that is going to work with us after the fact, then maybe I'll be prepared before. Are you following me? Uh, yes, sir. And, and again, I'd be happy to offer uh, any technical assistance from the federal government and be happy to make those connections at the state and local level to you, get you, to your goal. You do get requests, I assume, from people who've had property damaged, who provided them as shelters, uh, this property. You do get requests from people asking for some help after they've made the property I, I, I pr Probably, sir. I mean, I can't point out uh, any, but I, I, I'm sure that uh, there's many requests for uh, disaster assistance from all sorts, both uh, okay. public well, and private, for assistance. Okay, well, I, I can tell you. You, you do in Houston, because we have a good many churches who've done this. Uh, sir, let me ask you a quick question. Do you audit best practices, uh, lessons learned? Do you audit these things? Absolutely. Do, do you have a list of the lessons learned after Harvey that can be made available to me? Lessons learned. Um, so we have a report that we issued last September that, that <coughs> chronicles the response situation in, in Texas among the other states. And what we saw is some of the good things that happened and some of the lessons learned. And also FEMA has a comprehensive after action report that's publicly available that talks about that as well. Okay, I'd, I'd like to access those things when I'll have someone contact you. And I, I appreciate you. This really is a, an effort on my part to help people who really can't help themselves uh, when these emergencies occur. And they have homes, but they're not suitable for shelter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Cleaver. I yield back. Thank you. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Gannon, thank you for being here. Um, and I appreciate the, the fact you, you are well informed. Um, uh, and I, you know, uh, my colleague uh, a few minutes ago, uh, Ms. Rice, raised a question about, um, you know, the the, envir the changing uh, environment, the weather issues. And, uh, um, you know, yesterday we had a, a number of past EPA administrators, Republican and Democratic, who... Um, talked about the dismantling of EPA. My issue is, I, I know, I mean, cabinet members are, uh, ha, I mean, have to dance around president, the statements that the president makes that are not true, uh, like the ones Mr. our chairman asked earlier. And I, so I don't care. I just want you to, I mean, uh, I, I know you're, uh, you know, informed and bright, so you, that you run EPA in a manner with the understanding that, that we are experiencing climate change. I just left some world leaders um, meeting in the majority leader's office, and they're, they're, they can't understand why the most powerful uh, and intellectually su su uh, substantial nation is denying what the whole world is acknowledging. Forget that, that's, that, that's an editorial comment, and hopefully uh, you can respond to that in what you do. Uh, the, the chairman also asked about your staffing. And uh, how many people do you have in Congressional Affairs? Uh, I couldn't tell you, sir. But it's 10, 15, 20? I mean, it's probably uh, 10. Okay. Uh, the reason I'm asking is I represent Kansas City, Missouri. It's our largest city in our state. 
Um, and, and, and so my uh, congressional district represents the largest city. And then uh, uh, they, uh, when they, we redistricted the, the state, uh, they took a portion, a portion of Kansas City and then put me in the rural areas, which I, I'm representing the best I can. Uh, and we, we've been devastated by tariffs and by flooding, as you uh, probably understand. But my issue is, you know, uh, um, I, I, you know, people, the, 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 they've lost their crops. I mean, the soybeans and corn, they just, they, they've been devastated. And so I'm out meeting with my farmers. And, uh, and, and so with the governor, with our governor, uh, and uh, I, they, they raise the question to me that they raise every time disaster hits about the, the uh, 8.9 threshold uh, before they can get FEMA uh, emergency declaration. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, it, there's confusion. The governor uh, is saying, you know, I can't get solid information before it, SEMA, which is our state emergency uh, system, to it, put it in action because I, I, we're getting conflicting information. So I then sent a letter to, uh, uh, to you, uh, and, and I'm, I've been in government a long time, so I, you can't read everything and you can't, and I don't expect you to. I, I have the letter here, and if you read this letter and memorized what was sent, you, you need to be on uh, some of these game shows to win a lot of money. Uh, but uh, what, I, what I do want is for you to convince me that, that you, you're going to supply us with enough staff to respond at least to the committee. And the reason I'm saying that, I got uh, 50 farmers sitting in, out in front of me and the governor, my friend the governor. And, and, the, and I said, well, I'll find out. So I sent a letter on um, April 16th, and then I have another meeting with my farmers well, well, Congressman, what, what did they say? What did they say? You know, and so I have to uh, embarrassingly say, well, I don't have an answer yet. Now, even after the letter was sent, we, sent, we made phone calls. So something needs to be put in place, Mr. Secretary, to, to, that, that this can't happen. Because, I mean, my thought, if, if, if I'm going to get embarrassed, then I'm going to embarrass Mr. Gaynor. And then, but that's incongruent with who I am. Uh, so I just want you to fix it. Yes, sir. I, I hear your concern. So, uh, you know, you know, the conduit, I think, for all these requests is through our congressional affairs, the conduit. Uh, but we have uh, uh, thousands of talented staff that uh, answer some of these uh, very specific questions. And I, and I have not seen your letter, uh, but I'll make sure I go look for it. Uh, and so it gets staff to the agency uh, to make sure that we are as complete uh, and transparent about what your issue is. Uh, some, sometimes it, they're, they're easy questions, sometimes they're harder questions. I think we strive uh, to make sure that we're very responsive to Congress and the, uh, to Congress to make sure that uh, we hear your concerns and demands. Uh, but I will follow up on your letter. Uh, and again, I, we, we have uh, thousands of hardworking experts within the agency to try to- I understand, I to cut you off on my time to run out. When I was mayor of Kansas City, uh, I had my staff, I said to the staff, we had uh, 6,000 staffers. When I was a member of city council, uh, sends you your communication, I want to turn around in 10 days. I mean, you know, you, you don't turn around in 10 days, we got a problem. I'm just throwing it out. I hear you, sir. Gentleman's time has expired. Thank you, Chair. Uh, for the record, uh, uh, Mr. Gaynor, three members have indicated that they've written you letters and have yet to get a response. And I and all three members are members of this committee. And I would hope you'd go back and review how congressional uh, uh, correspondence is handled in your operation. Sir, I hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Richmond. company hired. Let me ask you a question. What is Core 3's contract? What are the terms of their contract? Are they paid in cost plus? 
No, sir, they're not a contractor. They are um, uh, a uh, element of, they're part of uh, the, the Commonwealth's government. They're not, they're uh, uh, Puerto Rican. Uh, Puerto Rican uh, employees for, for the government. They're, they're not a contractor. They're, they're, it's the governor's team uh, that is in charge of recovery. They are completely uh, part of the Puerto Rican government. Okay. Now, what contractors do you have? Now, by the way, I'm from New Orleans. I've been through Katrina. I've been through Rita. I've been through Isaac. I've been through Sandy, uh, Cindy. So, my experience is that you all usually have inspectors and other people quality control. And so who's the quality control in Puerto Rico? Uh, spe specifically for... Uh, the, the government project worksheets and doing the inspections, or is it all FEMA employees, or have you contracted out some? Oh, I think that, so uh, I think the first uh, level of making sure that, uh, you know, payments are legitimate, all the paperwork is there, is, is the government of Puerto Rico. Uh, mm -hmm. So you right. can start at the bottom with a local municipality who received money, uh, they have an obligation to make sure that uh, all the paperwork is, is correct. Uh, they submit it to Core 3 for review. Uh, we have a, a, a program that validates uh, uh, that paperwork to make sure, again, it's all, uh, it's all uh, correct. Uh, you know, we had uh, the Puerto Rico under what we call manual controls, uh, where, where we really went through all the paperwork. We released some of that because they have an uh, outstanding uh, fiscal control plan now. Uh, we do sampling uh, of some of the uh, of some of the submissions. Uh, we'll continue to sample that as we go, uh, make sure that uh, it stays within tolerance, and then and that we're not paying for anything that we don't get. Uh, so it, it really is kind of a process from the local uh, through the Commonwealth. But, but the my question is, on the FEMA side, is it all done through employees, or have you contracted with third-party administrators to do some of that work? I'm going to say it's all FEMA employees. I don't think we contract that out. Uh, let me ask. I, I will double check on that, but but uh, I'm generally confident that it's all FEMA employees. Let me ask you another question: uh, Does FEMA still have the policy, uh, according to the Stafford Act, that you all don't spend money on permanent housing and permanent repairs? Um, we no, we do permanent. I mean, it depends. For public assistance, individual public assistance. Well, individual public assistance is, is, is there are some repair uh, uh, funding inside of that, but permanent repairs uh, come under uh, uh, PA. Uh, but we do, we do uh, do permanent repairs in some cases and restoration. Uh, uh, HUD actually just uh, uh, recently approved about $1.8 million, $1 billion uh, for permanent work on uh, uh, housing that's uh, destroyed uh, and so, again, it's a team effort on who does what. Well, let, let me give you what the experience and what happens on the ground. So when the storm happens, FEMA comes in, and you all now have, and I'll give you credit for developing the STEP program, which is the shelter-in-place program. But part of the hindrance with the sh shelter-in-place program is that you will not do permanent repairs because you worry about duplication of benefits and other things. So let me just give you the most egregious example I've ever seen in my life. In a trailer park, we spent, the federal government, $90,000 to buy a trailer, move a trailer to a trailer park because we couldn't pay for permanent housing for the person in the trailer. When if we gave them $75,000, they would have bought a trailer and they would have been out of our, out of our hair they would have moved on with their future. We spend 90 to get it there. We pay to remove it. Then we have to give the family public assistance to help. So, and, and this is not necessarily just a FEMA problem. It's a Stafford Act problem. So what I'm asking you as the administrator is to help us help you. But what I need from you is honest answers about not being able to invest in permanent housing. So is that still a problem in rapid recovery? Uh, so I, I think it's a process. I think one of, one of the things that happens uh, right after disaster is we want to make, uh, make sure that disaster survivors are, uh, have a safe, uh, warm, safe, and dry place to go. Uh, so we do that through individual assistance. You can get uh, temporary sheltering in hotels. Uh, you can get money for repair, uh, temporary repairs. Uh, in Puerto Rico, but, we but, had- But see, you just said it. We can put you in a hotel, we can pay for temporary repairs. You're missing my whole point. Why just pay for temporary repairs? 
because we're spending the money twice. So when you do shelter in place, you put up a two by two square of sheetrock behind an outlet so that you could put the outlet cover on so that people can have electricity. So then when we pay for the permanent repairs, you have to go back in, take sheetrock out, take out the temporary bathroom unit, take out the temporary refrigerator unit. Why in the beginning can't we make an assessment of how to spend taxpayer money the best? And what I wanna do is partner with you so we can take all, all the foolishness out of the Stafford Act to allow you to be able to be more efficient. I'm not saying it's your problem. What I'm saying is it is a problem, but in order for us to fix it, you have to one, be honest about it, and two, articulate it so that we know we're not spending money time and time again just to go back and rip it out. So, you know, blue roofs are great, but a real roof is better. Uh, and I, I, again, I, I understand it, and I'd be happy to work with you and your staff on maybe some ideas where we can uh, streamline. This, this is a challenge, no, no doubt, right? So you bring up uh, uh, points that we've heard before, uh, and we need to do some work to improve how we deliver that uh, post-disaster housing. Uh, I'd be happy to uh, partner with you and your staff on uh, how we can make that uh, an improvement or change the Stafford Act to reflect uh, more common sense. Uh, uh, well, unfortunately, we have a lot of experience with it, and we will absolutely take you up on how to improve it. Yes, Thank sir. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chair. Recognize the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Clark. I thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I thank our ranking member for holding this hearing today. Uh, we are discussing FEMA's readiness for future disasters, and I represent Central Brooklyn, New York. And I have firsthand, uh, I have, I've seen firsthand the importance of effective disaster response efforts when Superstorm Sandy devastated my district. Lives were lost, and lives were upended, homes and critical infrastructure, including subway tunnels, flooded. And the recovery process continues to this day. That's why I know FEMA cannot be an afterthought at DHS. The president may want to make immigration enforcement the department's top priority, but the work FEMA does can mean the difference between life and death when a storm strikes. This important mission is why it is essential that FEMA remain apolitical. With the threat of climate change leading to rising sea levels and higher ocean temperatures, Superstorm Sandy will not be the last natural disaster to hit Brooklyn. Yet instead of acknowledging this reality, FEMA's 2018 through 2022 strategic plan removed mentions of climate change, including prior iterations of the, in the, of the strategic plan. How do we confront a threat as serious as climate change when you refuse to recognize its existence? So I have a couple of, of questions for you, Administrator Gaynor. As I mentioned, the strategic plan removed mentions of climate change, including uh, in prior iterations of the strategic plan. Do you believe that climate change is real and caused by human greenhouse gas emissions? Uh, Ma'am, I'm, I'm not a scientist, but what I do know is that FEMA uh, is ready to respond to any disaster uh, uh, within the United States, no matter of its cause. I mean, that's what we focus on every day. Uh, that's what we try to do every day uh, to an excellent level. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Okay. Uh, it, it would be good if... Um, uh, you consulted with scientists since you're not one because it's, it's, it's becoming evident. And what we can do now is uh, prepare in advance for hurricane seasons. Some of the work that we're talking about today are things that, the, that FEMA should be working on as we speak because hurricane season is just around the corner. Yes, ma'am. And, and I want to give Congress credit for passing the uh uh, DRRA uh, back in October, I think one of the things we can make a major difference is uh, in pre-disaster mitigation. Uh, we're trying to reduce the risk before any disaster. I think that is really our goal as uh, uh, FEMA uh, and the emergency management. So we 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 both agree that inevitably there's going to be disaster. There's going to be disaster. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so after Maria hit Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, President Trump tweeted that the Dems want to give them more, taking dollars away from our farmers and so many others. Apparently, he forgot that Puerto Ricans are U.S. citizens. What was the response within FEMA 
to this to this? I, I mean, are you in any conversation with the administration? I, you've got work to do on the ground and to get um, a diversion of dollars or to, to, to have false uh, choices. Um, I, I can't meet the needs of Americans, right? Uh, so ma'am, uh, we have today uh, 727 open disasters uh, dating as far back as the year 2000. Um, all those disasters uh, from- the So it's getting compounded then. What you're saying to me is that the challenges that we face with respect to these natural disasters hitting are becoming compounded at, because I know that in, in Brooklyn, and, you know, Superstorm Sandy, people are still recovering from that. So you're seeing a compounding of, um, of disaster relief and recovery efforts. So, uh, well, I mean, I think, you know, the, the record is the record. I mean, the disasters have happened for thousands, millions of years. They'll continue to happen. Uh, again, yeah, but we've recovered from those a thousand years ago. We, we're talking we about modern day. Yeah, so again, uh, we're, we're recovering in, in uh, you know, over 700 disasters uh, today uh, to include Puerto Rico and other places. Um, you know, again, I think part of what we want to do is make sure that we uh, invest in pre-disaster mitigation before it happens, because we know uh, from all the disasters that we've gone through that we'll pay any amount of money post-disaster. Uh, hey, an internal FEMA report last summer discussed a number of the shortcomings of the Maria response efforts, including the lack of supplies on Puerto Rico before the storm, unqualified staff, and challenges with delivering emergency supplies. But can we feel confident that these same problems would not occur if another storm were to hit the island this summer? If I can just uh, pick on the commodities uh, part of your question, uh, today we have six more, uh, six times more commodities uh, on Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands than we did uh, pre-landfall of Irma Maria. So, so you we, feel we, confident that the same problems would not reoccur if another storm were to hit this summer? I feel confident that we, we, we're as ready as we, we can be. We try to get, be more ready every day. the same problems would not occur? I, I believe the same problems would not occur. Okay, although although no two disasters are the same. Uh, well, hurricanes hitting islands, they tend to have the same outcomes. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Chair recognizes the lady from Florida, Ms. Demons, for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and I would love for you to say from Florida again. Um, my question, of course, is to Mr. Gaynor, and you know, I heard you say that for a thousand years, I mean, hurricanes will hit, and certainly I'm from Florida, and I knew, know that. Uh, I grew up in Florida, and while maybe God controls hurricanes and when they hit, uh, you are to control our responses to them and help people recover as quickly as they can. Let's make that a better process and a seamless process. Uh, and we all need to be concerned about that, and I don't think you would be in the position that you're in if you were not. Um, as members of Congress, we just want answers so we can thoroughly and faithfully represent the people um, in our various districts. And that does cross um, all political lines. Uh, my question for you, Mr. Gaynor, today will focus on um, FEMA's cooperation with utilities uh, following disasters. Um, you know, I, I have some painful memories of uh, Charlie, Francis, Jean, Irma, and Michael in Florida, and you know, if you don't know it, you heard the devastation that um, they caused and the number of people that were impacted. Uh, in 2018, as you've already talked about, that Congress sought to streamline FEMA's reimbursements to ensure that utilities were fairly and expeditiously compensated for power restoration. Many states, as you know, do things differently. However, many utilities in my home state of Florida still report delays due to repeated audits, inconsistent cost packaging methodology, and other delays. So for the record, uh, Mr. Gaynor, could you please clarify when are funds obligated to a pass-through entity? Are funds dispersed to a sub-recipient insulated from recall without an audit? So um, let me just uh, go back uh, on a couple of uh, comments that you made. So re recovery is, is a, 
uh, FEMA, uh, you know, we, we own some of that, but really is uh, uh, a process that takes local, state, and federal. How well I know, I do know to, that. To recover, yes. so it's just not yes. FEMA recovering. Right, but and, everybody, FEMA certainly plays a major role in we, that recovery process, we do. is we do. that correct? We do, and, and okay. we, we support. Okay, would you please answer the question that I asked you, and only because my time is extremely limited, and I need to hear your answer to the question that I asked. Well, I'm trying. I think I'm trying to answer it. Okay, I'm just saying please that. Please go we, ahead. In, in recovery, we're trying to support uh, the local elected officials' recovery plan. So, uh, whether it's in Florida or a county in Florida or it's a, mm -hmm. a state, uh, we're supporting that recovery plan. It is not a federal recovery plan. Uh, you're absolutely right. We have a major role in that, in funding recovery to make sure that we all, uh, you know, uh, recover as, as quickly and as efficiently as we can. Uh, and, and, the, and the other part of your question about utilities, can you mm -hmm. just... When are funds obligated to a pass-through entity, are funds dispersed to a sub-recipient insulated from recall without an audit? Uh, no, I think all funds are subject to uh, audit. Uh, no matter what level and to what entity that receives them. I think that's just part of uh, federal statute. Uh, so so the, the, the way it works uh, is that uh, we don't, the federal government is not getting any direct relationship with uh, anyone other than the, uh, the grantee, in this case, whether it's the state or a local or a county. Uh, all the uh, business dealings with uh, who you hire or uh, contractors that are doing work for you uh, between the contractor and the local entity that hires them. Uh, we run a, uh, a program that is based on uh, reimbursement. Uh, so if there's an issue about a certain contractor or a certain project, uh, that is between, uh, we'll make it simple, the state and whoever they're doing business with at the local the Okay, let level. me ask you this. What is FEMA doing to ensure that states have adequate assurance that barring fraud or misconduct, FEMA or OIG will not recall reimbursements uh, in the way that FEMA initially packaged or approved them? Uh, I'm not, uh, I'd have to go back on what our authority is on, on that, but I'm gonna say that uh, whether it's the OIG or the GAO or another uh, uh, government entity that's looking at uh, how money was spent, I think, they're going to they're going to look at whatever they want to look at uh, to make sure that there's. Uh, How do you believe, personally, Mr. Gaynor, based on your expertise, that we can streamline the process? Well, I, I think, so, uh, and let me just use uh, those uh, local and state government officials yep. and entities that you talked about can restore, bring restoration yes. to people that are suffering. So I think How do you think we can streamline the So I think uh, we're trying to do that uh, both in Harvey, Irma, and Maria with uh, validate as you go. Uh, so typically in a recovery. Uh, you know, uh, in a traditional way, a legacy way, we would, eight, we would wait to the end of recovery to, to, before we start validating paperwork. That could be years uh, in the making. And so trying to go back and find a piece of paper from five or six years ago uh, typically leads from uh, de-obligations, a clawback of that money. Uh, that's not good business practice. We realize that. Uh, so we have a program, Validate As You Go. Uh, we're using it in Florida uh, to make sure we just do it in, in quarters, right? So we're going to uh, validate every quarter. We're going to make sure it's uh, completely uh, audit proof and we're going to move on. Uh, that's how we're doing it today. Okay, so uh, that's some, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm out of time. Well, are you satisfied? With well, I, if I could just one more, please. Uh, that's something that we're doing. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. What additional ways do you believe, based on your expertise and knowledge and experience with the process, do you believe that we can utilize, you can utilize to streamline the process even further, to make it more well, uh, so, I mean, we take, efficient? If we take a step back, I think recovery, uh, no matter where it's applied, is complex. I think, again, we recognize that in our third goal of our strategic plan that we but want jurisdiction to shouldn't be bogged down because of paperwork redundancy. We'd ought to make the process more easier, not more complicated and difficult. Would uh, you agree with that? So I would, I would again, I, you know, as an emergency manager in a local and a state, I want to make it easy on myself as possible, but I don't want to subject myself to, a, to an audit that results in a clawback where you have to go tell your mayor or your governor that you're losing $20 million. So 
I'm sorry, when I was saying easier, I was actually talking about the people who are suffering from uh, damage from a hurricane. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman, for your endurance. Chair recognized the the gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, To Mr. Um, Curry, um, one of the things that the GAO found was the lack of capacity with FEMA. Would you just uh, uh, restate that, please? Sure. Um, what 2017 showed because of the sequential disasters is that they lacked enough staff with the right skills and resources to cover all those disasters. Um, obviously, many of us uh, face hurricanes every season. My district was uh, pointedly hit, mm-hmm. devastatingly hit with Hurricane Harvey. To date, we are still recovering. You can't go through neighborhoods that are not trying to nail up and nail down, uh, and as well, getting ready for hurricane season of 2019. 2018, we like to say we missed the bullet. Uh, My my question to you is, do you also uh, think that FEMA lacks uh, the expansive resources that is represented by now the seemingly increasing and very diverse, meaning regionally diverse? You're either in hurricanes, tornadoes, um, flooding, um, hurricanes or uh, tornadoes turn to flooding. Uh, do you think there is a question of resources? Absolutely, I think there's a question of resources. Um, I think that yeah, I think we're just hoping and praying that, frankly, there's not you know another couple catastrophics this year on top of what Mr. Gaynor said was managing 700 or more open disasters right now. Um, well, first of all, thank you for your detailed work. We we would do wise. Uh, to follow your roadmap that you've given us. One of the other questions I wanted to pose, and I'll uh, pose to uh, Mr. Gaynor, but um, I've always found when I'm on two phones in the command center, uh, the dichotomy between the state, the way they have it, having to ask the federal government and FEMA to come or to do something, local officials completely baffled. I remember getting a call from a mayor who was not even in my jurisdiction who was fighting with the state because he wanted to use barges because his whole public housing had gone underwater. He couldn't get permission from the state uh, that then was trying to deal with FEMA. So uh, do you think, I think the question on on GAO, the streamlining, uh, the sort of allowing um, the the jump start maybe of a local official being able to trigger what is needed and the affirmation of the state streamlining it where people are on the ground suffering, drowning, if you will, don't have any housing, and you have to wait through this bureaucracy in the middle of an emergency. Do you think we need to do better than that? I understand. I totally understand the scenario you're talking about, and I can see where that would be a challenge. I have to say, to FEMA's credit, when you look at their preparedness and response areas, they are ingrained with the state and local communities, and and they are in lockstep with them. I I mean, I travel around. I go to these disaster locations numerous times. I hear it from state and locals that, that they're there when they need them and, and they usually get what they need. I think what you're talking about though would require a change in the existing structure, which is that needs come from the lowest level and work their way up through the process. And FEMA, as Mr. Gaines said, has to react to the, requ- the formal request from the state before it can actually activate the federal resources. Uh, and, and I know that we're both being entrapped by that and there are good people on the state level, but it creates an enormous problem. Uh, Let me ask Mr. Gaynor, first of all, let me thank all of the many FEMA employees that I have worked with. Let me cite Mr. Jason Nelson, who I think has been at FEMA before FEMA started, and he has been a giant in many different disasters, uh, and many others have been stupendous. Thank you for your service. Um, But let me frame for you uh, an approach that I think uh, the community is asking for. Number one, um, the idea of creating Uh, the opportunity for FEMA to pre-educate states uh, and local governments on what to ask for. One of the problems is the slowness in getting back to you. Is that what you usually say when I say you, FEMA? What do you need? And so to be able to help educate them pre-disasters, would that be helpful? Uh, Yes, ma'am. And we have a pretty robust training uh, capacity within FEMA. Uh, But we could do more. Uh, we, we could always do more. I, I have quick questions, so that's a good answer that you gave. The other thing is um, that I found in Hurricane Harvey, there's a time when you come in immediately um, to deal with the people you know, drowning, people in, uh, uh, in shelters, and then there is a long period of time. Uh, and what happens with that is FEMA has a time when they're no longer there. People use the word FEMA, and they, they find a sense of comfort. 
So think of this in this manner, if we were able to help you do first a rescue point where you have people coming in and then give you the ability to have a long-term recovery where you make an ultimate decision as to when it is appropriate to leave. And that is different from what you have now. How could you work with that? So, uh, ma'am, I, I think I'm fortunate to have been a local emergency manager and a state emergency manager now at the federal level. So, I mean, I've, I've kind of seen it from all angles. Uh, th this business of emergency management is a partnership. Uh, from the lowest level, whether you're in a one-man office uh, in, in the middle of South Dakota or you're in a, in a big office like uh, uh, Texas Emergency Management uh, working for NIM Kid, um, it, it is a partnership on all levels. Uh, we rely, as a state director, I relied on my local uh, emergency management capacity to make sure that they had capacity at the my, local level. My time level. is ending. I, I uh, think the question that I'm just trying to finish on and they've called votes. Right, so let me get this last question. What I'm trying to say, if we had a component where FEMA was on the ground for a longer period of time under the umbrella of recovery, could that be helpful uh, in the idea of disasters? Uh, it, it could be, and, and, I, and, and I hate to say no, and I, I don't really wanna say yes, because every disaster is unique. I'd be happy to work, uh, I think, with your staff to, to get to like some of the specifics that you're trying to get at to maybe uh, find well, those of us who've been in disasters believe it would be helpful, and I thank the chairman, and we're adding money uh, in this particular initiative, but uh, you need to be able to admit that people are looking for FEMA six months down the road, and you're not there. I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair, recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. And, Payne. And I'll, and I'll be very brief, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we don't have very much time. We have to go vote, so um, I'll just really just ask this one quick question. Um, Mr. Gaynor, um, in my capacity as chairman of the Emergency Preparedness Subcommittee, uh, you know, I've been advised that FEMA is unwilling to provide a hearing witness after receiving almost two months notice um, for two of my subcommittee hearings. Are you aware of that? Uh, no, sir, can you be more specific on on two occasions, I have had subcommittee hearings sure. of the Emergency Preparedness Response and Recovery Committee, which you come under that purview, and have not been able to get a witness to come from FEMA. That's a problem. Sir, uh, it's the first I've heard of it, and uh, I'll, I'll connect with your office to make sure that it's rectified immediately. Okay, and I'll yield back, sir. Thank you very much. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Mississippi. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Uh, at this time, I'd ask unanimous consent to enter into record a chart illustrating the various commodity stocks within Puerto Rico as provided by FEMA. Uh, this is in response to some questioning uh, that Ms. Rice uh, asked uh, Acting Secretary Gaynor. Without objection. Uh, and and uh, I have uh, similar insertions into the record. A uh, letter from Ox Oxfam an article on the politics of poverty, as well as a, a letter from Child Care Aware of America, testimony without objections. Uh, one, one question, uh, well, two. Uh, Mr. Curry, uh, if we were to have a repeat of the 2017 hurricane season this year, uh, would FEMA be prepared to respond in your opinion based on your report? I think it would be prepared to respond. I think that we'd, we'd likely still face some of the similar workforce challenges and shortages that we faced in 2017. So I, one of my earlier questions talked about workforce and we're really concerned uh, if we do have that repeat. Uh, I want to be on record to say that uh, we see it as a potential problem, and we hope, uh, Mr. Administrator, that you, you address that accordingly. Yes, sir. Uh, information. Um, the President said uh, after Hurricane Maria that there were six to 18 deaths. Um, what is your official death count uh, for Hurricane Maria? Uh, so, yes, sir. Uh, first of all, um, 
you know, one death is too many uh, in, any, in any disaster. So, uh, you know, one of the missions of emergency managers is to protect life. Uh, and we, we try to do that uh, every day, and we try to do that by being proactive to make sure people understand risk. Um, you know, we're not the source of uh, mortality data at FEMA, although we're users. And, and again, I'd like to thank Congress for uh, passing DRA. Uh, in uh, one of those sections, uh, DRA 1244, uh, we were directed to uh, conduct a mortality and morbidity study, and we've done that through the National Academy of Medicine. Uh, that study is ongoing. I think we look forward to the results of that so we can be better informed, better prepared for the next disaster. So what's your count? Uh, I, I don't, You're saying I don't, that you don't know how many people died in Hurricane Maria in P Puerto Rico? Yes, sir. Typically... Uh, yes or no? Sir, I'm just, I'm just going to tell you, we don't, we don't count deaths, but uh, typically it's local and state county health departments that are responsible for uh, mortil morbidity I, I, and look, mortality look, we're, data. We're charged to try to help. If I told you that FEMA has paid for 800 burials. Yes, sir, we have. So does that mean they died based on Hurricane Maria? Uh, typically, our program um, uh, supports disaster survivors and those who have deceased with the, our uh, funeral uh, program. I'm not, dis I'm not disputing that we we provided uh, burial um, entitlements to almost 900 Mr. Puerto Ricans. Uh, if FEMA paid for 800 burials. Uh, based on the disaster declaration for Hurricane Maria. Would that be considered an official death count? Uh, well, no, sir, not. A, those two things wouldn't naturally correlate because there's all sorts of, you know, I couldn't get into the details about why they pay certain things. They also pay for grave sites that were damaged. But um, Mr. Gaynor's right. It's, the state and local government determines uh, their official death count. In the case of Puerto Rico, um, they determined, they, they conducted a study recently, GW uh, did the study, and they revised their official death count to over 2,700. And so we're doing, we're doing ongoing work looking at both how Puerto Rico did that, but also Texas and Florida and what changes were made. So hopefully we uh, never face this challenge in identifying this again. So we know it's at least 2,700. That's the official, that's Puerto Rico's official, new, new official death count according to the GW study. Thank you. Uh, chair recognizes ranking member. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Just a point of clarification uh, in response to some questions asked by Mr. Payne. Uh, outside of this hearing, uh, has FEMA been invited to participate in other hearings before this committee? To your knowledge? You saying to me? Yeah, yes, sir. Has uh, has uh, have, have they been invited well, to participate? Well, the in subcommittee chair indicated that uh, he's offered. Uh, the request for FEMA to have witnesses. So I have no reason to doubt it. And did, uh, to, to your knowledge, did FEMA fail to appear at those hearings? Well, the process is subcommittee chairs uh, invite the witnesses of their choosing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for their questions. The members of the committee may have additional questions for the witnesses, and we ask that you respond expeditiously in writing to those questions. Without objections, the committee record shall be kept open for 10 days. Hearing no further business, the committee stands adjourned.